OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. That was so you could all do your air guitar just as you get out of the shower this morning at half past seven. Owen, how are you? Very well, Ger. What's what, the crack? What's your go-to air guitar tune? Oh, good tune. Uh, good question, rather. <laughs> wow, good start. Um, I'm trying to think. Like, I mean, I, I'm not... Uh, I was never a guitar player. The closest I ever came was Guitar Hero. And I remember, like... Was it any good? Uh, guitar Hero was good. D- I had DJ Hero as well, which I was much better at, which was... Um, like, mock spinning. It, there was a little bit of mock spinning, but, like, you, you, you got DJ Hero and you're like, wow, I'm going to be... Fatboy Slim. Like I'm gonna be like Fat Boy Slim, exactly. I'm gonna I'm gonna be absolutely tearing down this house with uh, what I'm doing on the decks and then actually when you get it it's like red, green, blue, green, red. And that's as glamorous as the, the whole thing got for uh, for DJ Hero. Some might say that would actually have been the perfect breeding ground for today's DJs, who of course are not spinning wheels at all. Oh, controversial. Controversial. I, I think there would be plenty of people who would uh, who would disagree with you in that air guitar tune. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I, I think the through the fire and the flames was like the the toughest expert level on guitar hero. How does that so go? I actually couldn't tell you to be honest. I just remember that that was that was hard. That was difficult. Seven thirty two this yours? morning. I don't know. I don't. I don't really have. Oh, well, <laughs> usually you. I, I like bought enough time for you there to like. Come I know. Up with a really I know. Good I was like, no, not going to. Okay. I guess that would be something by Metallica, right? That would be the type of thing that you could do that to. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, good for you. It's a beautiful image that we've put into everybody's mind this morning at 7.32. You're very welcome along to OTBAM. Jerry and Owen with you through till 10 o'clock this morning. As ever, we'd love to hear from you. The hashtag is OTBAM. You can uh, get us at Off the Ball AM on Twitter or, of course, you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. Um, what did you want to happen when the penalty started last night? So if anybody doesn't know, Rangers were beaten by Antrak Frankfurt. Aaron Ramsey, who, you know, you're like, oh, Aaron Ramsey, that's an interesting career. I wonder, is this, is this maybe the... It's one of the biggest games he's played in. Certainly club level. Is it the biggest game? How many... Did, did Arsenal reach a Europa League final? They did. Aaron Ramsey was gone by then, though, wasn't he? Was he? Yeah, this is 2019. Aaron Ramsey had uh, departed to uh, sunnier climes and to Juventus by that point. So his uh, career path was joining Juventus in 2019. So He would have played Champions League games. Did he play in that Europa League final? I remember. I remember nothing from that. The, the Giroud final when Chelsea um, did Arsenal. I'm literally going to look at the team sheets here. I can't remember if it was Ramsey around for that or not. But 2019, he moves on to Juventus. So, um, so you were you were cheering for Aaron Ramsey? A little bit of late career redemption last night, or were you like over my dead body? I think it's ah no, not like I mean the the, the whole Rangers thing is is an interesting one. Like I think a lot of people in this country maybe would have supported Celtic more 20 years ago 15 years ago the O'Neill era for sure and ca- like of course you still carry that with you and you still want Rangers to lose but it's not the sort of jumping up and down when they eventually do lose at the end of it there is definitely a part of it that comes into it where it's like I kind of like Aaron Ramsey as a footballer and I kind of wouldn't, wouldn't mind him seeing scoring a penalty here but in an overall sense he wanted to track Frankfurt to win the game for sure and the penalties were good. Ramsey's penalty was terrible. He looked nervous when he stepped up. He looked it looked like he struck it nonchalantly where the only thing that was in his head was don't put this ball over the bar, don't put this ball over the bar and he put the ball into the keeper's arms. And um, yeah, Kevin Trapp is probably the, the hero of the night for Frankfurt given his save from the free kick in extra time and then the free from what was or the save from what was uh, looked like an open goal and one of the biggest chances of the match in extra time as well. And then, uh, of course, at the, the end of the game as well. So um, he's he'll probably go down as, as as an icon for them, and and Aaron Ramsey a bit of a villain for Rangers. Yeah, I wonder what happens now. Did is he is he just on loan till the end of this season, or is there is there more of Aaron Ramsey to come in the Rangers jersey, like or on the bench for the next while, whatever big wages he's on there. So I, I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if he, he sticks around. Um, interesting that Frankfurt had was it at least three left footed kickers for the penalties. Like that's a higher portion of the team than is in the general population. Are they recruiting left-footed players? And like, is that the next Moneyball thing where you have a team of 11, 11 left-footers? <laughs> Possible. Like, I mean, you could you could definitely have like a, a left-leaning team where your left winger uh, goes to the, the touchline all the time, and your right winger is an Aryan Robin, and that that's it. And the same goes for your 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 right full back. Um, Possibly. Uh, you might be onto something here. There could be like a tactical shift here. Uh, Aaron Ramsey is 31 at this point, so he's obviously gone through a lot of injury troubles in his career. It's it's hard to know if that's going to be something he's that... Only, uh, he's actually only on loan, and I don't know when his um, Juve contract is up, but we can... Um, 
No, nothing, nothing coming back on that. <laughs> uh, okay, in tiny writing, uh, on the 31st of January, Ramsey signed a loan for the remainder of the 21 20, 20. He signed a four year contract with uh, Juventus in, in February 2019. Okay, so, was, uh, so he goes until the middle of next season. Uh, on his Wikipedia, um, it's already been altered to say he bottled it at the end of his transfer. <laughs> I do see it here, actually. Yeah. Wiki harsh. <laughs> I, I don't know. The, um, the there was footage of the fans clashing beforehand. It didn't seem the most outrageous stuff that you've ever seen. It wasn't Marseille. It wasn't um, journalist and Stan Collymore levels of of uh, nonsense. But it was it was not great. Like it does feel like there was videos doing rounds as well of the previous night of Eintracht Frankfurt fans roaming the streets of Seville looking for a fight and there was a video of a, of a guy from a balcony and it was just like a lot of men just making a lot of noise while walking in a big group through the city. I was like, where's where's the evidence here of the the trouble? And I think there, were, there was trouble, but it wasn't on video footage. It was then yesterday, yesterday afternoon, when those metal chairs, I think they'd upgraded from plastic chairs. The, mm, like they the, do look more dangerous, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Seville uh, population, braver, I guess, to, to put out metal chairs and uh, it was who could fling a metal chair in the most uh, aggressive fashion would win. It does feel that it's not a prime way of trying to injure an opponent is throwing a metal well, object a, from a good distance. Exactly, because there's like a long kind of, oh, this is going to take me a huge effort you to You do get telegraph it. what you're about to do. Yeah. If you're throwing a metal chair at somebody, I think your opponent will know that you are throwing a metal chair at them. It's not very subtle, is it? No, it's not. And it, it tends to be like drunk, kind of flabby middle-aged men who should know better who are doing it. Yeah. Who aren't like they're not exactly specimens. No, there was one guy though who had uh, he was wearing shorts, he was topless, and had a balaclava on. That's the that's the look of twenty twenty two summer if you're if you're out there. Anybody <laughs> going to festivals? That's that's the get up you need. Yeah, uh, the Frankfurt fans in the stadium all uh, wearing their white jerseys. I was looking at this going. I hope the Kildare designers are having a night. Oh, this is their home stadium that um, we have some footage of. Wow, that looks great. This is them celebrating the aftermath of the penalties. They, they filled out their home stadium for a viewing party. And the big screen is like absolutely massive, the size of the hill. Um, pretty good. Yeah, it looks absolutely class. The all in white uh, thing last night as well looked look brilliant. Then, in fairness, there it, it was a, like a, a nice kind of colour clash in the stands between the two sets of fans. I saw a lot of people saying that the Rangers fans were maybe a little bit quieter than they, than they would have expected or were making a lot of noise throughout it. I suppose when you have uh, 100,000 people going to Seville or so they reported to watch this game there's going to be a lot of genuine fans who actually don't get into the ground and maybe uh, it's not exactly the, the Ibrox atmosphere that, that you'd expect in there and also the tension I think you know when you're there to vocally support a team I'm not sure about you but uh, at the most uh, uh, at the most nerve wracking moments for your team I oh, certainly quite. go to the sense of, of silence yeah no, totally I uh, need a bit more celebration lads Rangers didn't win a European Cup Wakers Ladia says Patrick Campbell I don't think God had anything to do with it given that you all have the same God, like, you know, except that you believe that the actual body of Christ is uh, eaten and drink, drunk every week and they're like, mm, not really sure I can buy that. That's no, the fundamental difference here. There is a piece of scripture that rules out throwing metal chairs at uh, your brother, so that's why. Unless you're in the temple and you're Jesus himself. Yes, In course. which case, beat the head out of everybody. Yeah. Uh, Fergus Kyo says, we all knew Ramsey was going to miss, didn't we? Um, I actually thought loads of them were going to miss before that. The first, the first penalty taker was like a two-step I'm like, oh, oh, not sure about that. The other thing is that, um, oh, oh, all the stats show that uh, the first victory is to to win the coin toss. Okay. Coin toss? Coin toss. Because, you know, you got to go first. In front of your home fans. But, like, last week and this week. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. I, I thought Liverpool <coughs> were dead after Mane missed as well at the weekend because the crowd behind that goal was going to win it for Chelsea and we saw Tuchel's response to that and he'd obviously seen the the statistics what was interesting uh, was uh, Van Bronckhorst last night saying with penalties it's a lottery not exactly what you want to hear your manager say afterwards like, Van Bronckhorst said that? yeah oh wow if you, uh, what an I, idiot I presume if you're going like. into a final you make sure that penalties is not a lottery whatsoever there's a reason why you chose to play in front of your home fans because there are different factors that can uh, impact it but like I mean he brought on Aaron Ramsey before yeah. a penalty shootout like that would suggest to me that he realises that you can rig the lottery to, to help you but um, maybe they didn't, didn't actually do as much preparation as you would have thought. I think maybe after you lose, you say stuff like that to try and give some comfort yeah. to the people and particularly to give yourself a little bit of a shield for not doing as much work as the opposition. 
Yeah, possibly. And like I mean, Aaron Ramsey probably if you asked him he probably would have thought penalties are a lottery as well given the way he struck it he was like let's just get this on target uh, and they will turn to go in there was there was um, definitely somebody who like just snuck it straight down the middle as the keeper dived and you're like it's a very it's it it's the equivalent of a panenka without having the flamboyance to do the panenka yeah yeah um, and, and g- given that uh, a goalkeeper will more than likely dive at one point it's not like it's not like actually one of the worst ways you can go about it but but there were good penalties from. I think it's ballsy. Night. I definitely feel like it's not what I would do. I feel like I would be. A, uh, I'm going to try and hit this tiny little square in the corner, and that's it. So look, pretend that you've got all the ability in the world. That that's your. And you're talking top corner or bottom corner? Uh, top. Okay. There's more room for it to like. There's there's more opportunity for it to go in. There's more opportunity for it to go in if you try and go for the bottom corner though, and if you hit it too high, it's still on target. Whereas if you go for the top corner, and it goes too high. Obviously. <laughs> it's not going to be on target. So I think you've underthought your uh, penalty routine there. Uh, was was it also one of the were one of the um, Frankfurt penalties right in off the upright, which looked like oof, that was very close to cannoning back out. Yeah, well, if you go in off the upright, it's a perfect penalty, just accidentally so. Yeah, it's you're you're cutting it fine. Uh, OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Three big games in the Premier League tonight: Everton Palace. Um, I, I, we haven't really talked about Patrick Vieira I, I just assumed Patrick Vieira was going to crash and burn like many of the previous managers who've come into that job who wasn't Roy Hodgson and he's done a better job than we anticipated and they're playing much better football than they did ever under Roy Hodgson and like you know this is a manager who was not that successful in France Yeah, um, and then went and learned his trade and spent time in the background and I don't know I'm, I mean hats off I would say to Patrick Vieira for doing what he's done yeah, no, definitely. And I, I do think that there has been maybe, uh, like the for, first, the, the general emotion is just surprised that Crystal Palace have not been in the relegation conversation at all because I think a lot of people would have had them penciled in as as a team that could go down. Themselves and Burnley were the, they have to go down this year sort of crew. Uh, Vieira starts really well. I think we're kind of surprised because he starts very well. I, I'd just be a little bit cautious about maybe their prospects next season and beyond just because of the resources that they have and, and can they still stay in the Premier League for the long term. At the moment, they're on 45 points. They finished last season under Hodgson with 44 points. Sure, they still have two more games to, to, and they already have one point more. But it's not like it's been this massive leap forward points-wise. But it, on the, in the style of play and in the sustainability of what they're doing, it looks like I think they're in a so, much yeah. better place. And yeah. next season, they could get even better. But I ju- I'd just be worried about maybe the, the resources that they have to actually contend when you look at maybe some of the teams that are coming up. And the, 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 like the, the thing is, they're playing the right style of football when you look at those teams that are coming up, like Fulham uh, in particular. Uh, the Premier League is going to be... Uh, probably a better place for the teams that are coming up from the championship and because of the fact that Crystal Palace are staying in there like I think you probably usually finish that sentence by saying and because Burnley are going down but I think that might be a little bit harsh on Michael Jackson what he's done Everton Palace uh, Chelsea Leicester and Villa versus Burnley uh, so Burnley are on 34 points it, it'll be interesting to see what mm-hmm. Villa's performance level is like they, they just beat Burnley and if they were to like go into the next season with a lot of wins wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that be very interesting? If they were to be able to, to just keep that form going. What's what? the, What's the motivation here for? How, how does How does Gerard play this? Look, I'm not sure. Is it just you or is the Aston Villa fan base in general the most paranoid bunch of people at the moment? Like you're wishing against your team. Not not all, not all of you. Oh. I think there's about like two or, there's about two or three percent of you, like not wishing against your team. But when when you feel happiness. A little part of your brain says, "I shouldn't feel this thing because if the happier I get, the more chance there is of us losing our manager." Like, does Jurgen Klopp's contract the other day not make you more comfortable in this relationship that you have with Steven Gerrard? Uh, look, uh, yes, I, I also, I don't think Steven Gerrard's going to turn out to be a world class manager because the odds are stacked against him. They really are really stacked against you being so brilliant at this thing that you're like a brilliant world class player. And then you have this separate second career, which is completely different, and you're also world class at it. How many world class managers are there? Uh, it's a good question. 10, like, 15. Are, like, are you talking? Okay, if you're extending it to that, because um, like, I would have thought like that. If you include Didier Deschamps having won multiple tournaments, you probably do. Possibly, but like the Dubai extension includes Zidane and in that for winning multiple Champions Leagues. I mean, you would have to say Zidane is the outlier, right? As a former player at that level who reaches. like the, let, let's assume that I'm wrong about Carlo Ancelotti and that he's a, like a genuinely think, world-class I think manager. we can put him in there, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, like, Ancelotti was good, not great. He was definitely nowhere near as good a footballer as Gerrard. He was, like, in the team. 
always in the team, totally deserved his place in the team, but not in the top 10 central midfielders in the world at the time. Mm-hmm. So you wouldn't say that he has parlayed a world-class football talent as a player and then copied that. Maybe he's the same level as a footballer as he's a manager and just got incredibly lucky everywhere he's gone, I don't know. But my point is, Stephen Gerrard's very unlikely, just by virtue of the lottery of life, he's very unlikely to be Jurgen Klopp. Like, he really is very unlikely to be that good. But that's that's what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at here. I, I think that if you're saying he's going to be a world-class manager, you've got to be saying, is he going to be in the same air as Klopp and Pep and Ancelotti and Conte and... Um, I think I think that'd be a big a big leap from where he is at the moment, and that doesn't mean he can't be a very very good manager and can't get it can't be a Champions League manager, but it, the the cream of the crop at the moment in football management is better than it's ever been. Uh, Owen Bell says, "Thou shalt not throw metal chairs." That's the commandment <laughs> that's written in scripture. It is. Uh, James McCullough says, "Did Owen actually answer his favorite air guitar song, or did he just waffle on about a computer I game?" I just totally waffled on. I'm. It's a. Ter- it's a terrible question. I re- like. There's some questions that you get asked, and you're really awkward about it. Like personal CD details. Turns out for me, what's your favorite air guitar song? Is the one that makes me more most awkward. Do you have an answer now? No, I don't. We'll think about it for the next the rest of the rest of the show. Uh, Seven forty-seven. We're a little bit late for this. Tommy Rooney's going to join us in a moment. First, here's a clip from the last football pod with Paddy and James. When you look at Dublin, though, and their decision making as well, Paddy, I think a lot of those mead shots started to be taken out of panic as well because that oh, panic sets in. Totally, no uh, option. It's just and they've, right. they have negative. they have been there. Like none of those players want to go through what they're doing against me, Dublin year after year in the Leinster Championship. It is embarrassing. And it's it's tough to take. Do something about it. No, yeah. Do something about it. Andy McAdee's giving out about someone diving, or all the talk about it shouldn't be in Crow Park. Move it out of there because that makes a difference. But that was Focus me. Focus on your skills. It annoys me. It annoys me when teams are looking, pointing the finger everywhere else, but themselves. And I know Andy's not like that. I have massive respect for him, uh, but. That, that was annoying yesterday looking at Mead because it it's no good for Mead obviously no good for Dublin it's no good for the Leicester Championship that Championship is dying in front of our eyes like and Mead need to be competitive the county they are the tradition they have and it's not good to see like so Jim Brilliant. Gavin always makes a good point he goes uh, in the pressure moments and Mead were under serious pressure in that first half every moment was a pressure moment but he goes you fall back to the level of your training. Yeah. Like, it's so true. You don't rise so to the occasion, you fall to the level of your training. Exactly. It, like, yeah, that, is, that is so true. When you're in the heat of the battle and you know you're under pressure, if you have it done on the training field, you have the hours put in, it'll come right for you. If you don't, you're throwing the ball up and buying it. <laughs> Do you know that is the, what? That's Honestly, the difference? That is the difference. Uh, no. It's uh, James Tintin O'Donoghue there this week um, <laughs> alongside Paddy Andrews and Tommy Rooney. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock. Tommy Rooney coming up right now. We're talking about the football pod. Uh, have you seen with Joseph Conroy is the Alex Ferguson documentary which is on Amazon Prime at 8.10. Sports pages at 8.35. Gavin Kilkenny uh, is going to join us at 8.50 to talk about his season and his hopes for the off-season. Alan Quillen at 10 past 9 will pick his joint Munster and Leinster team. It's all Leinster. And then OTB reaction for Wednesday Night Rugby at half past nine at 7.50 this morning. Tommy Rooney, good morning to you. Morning, Jerry. Morning, Owen. So, the, the death of Mead football has been under-exaggerated for a change. Yeah. That was bad at the weekend. And it certainly feels like it when you have somebody like Paddy Andrews getting so upset about how annoying it was. Owen, I know you were sitting beside him. I've been there before with Paddy at Dublin Mead Games. At least I got the third quarter last year where I could say, oh, Paddy, there's something happening here. Did his anger levels increase as the game went on? Uh, no, not really. I don't think there was any uh, that would suggest some sort of positivity around the game, but not anger would have been a reaction mm. to something. It was just dis- despondence. Yeah, it was like... I'm angry, I'm disappointed. It was just, <laughs> exactly, or this feeling that uh, this this... We're at the home of Gaelic games and what we're seeing in front of us is just so insignificant, especially with Monaghan Derry happening at the same time and the hurling happening at the same time. Um, you'd yeah. almost dual screen it while being in the <laughs> while being in the stadium in the second half of that game. Like Tommy, you saw this coming. There's no way in hell you would have gone to the United States of America at the same time of a Meath championship game if there was any chance that they'd actually uh, we're gonna we're gonna beat them. Well, Owen, you couldn't have paid me to be in Crow Park last Sunday in advance of that game. And that's the truth. 
in advance of the game, so you knew it was coming? Uh, I thought if the game was outside of Crow Park, there may have been a chance of a kind of cork-like performance against Kerry. There may be a chance where you'd have something you could build on, like we've had sort of last year, where you kind of come out of Crow Park thinking, do you know what, we got 15 minutes right there. Or even in 2019 where, okay, we didn't score, but the Dubs only scored four or five points in the first half of that game when Meade lost by 20 points to 1-4. And the Dubs didn't get a goal that day either. So you were clinging on to tiny things over the last couple of years that maybe there was a, you know, a, a bounce coming or there was something coming with this team because there are good young footballers in Meade and there are a core of players like Kyogen and Menton who were very, very good and, and who are still very capable. But... Yeah. I think it just all culminated last Sunday into the dubs kicking 117 out of 18, 117 out of 19 shots in front of the D without any resistance. And it was just so bad. Why did that happen? Like, have you watched the full thing back? Did you watch the full thing over in America? No, no, no. I watched, I watched the full thing in, on GA Go. Right. Um, my last day in Manhattan, own two hours of it. And, uh, you know, um, you're sitting there watching and you're just, I actually just turned it off out of pure despondency. I put it on and I packed my bag in the room. I had it on my phone. I had it on the big screen in the house. I didn't want anyone else to see it. It kind of felt like I can't be showing anyone else this in my county. <laughs> uh, that, like, there's a... My cousin's there. My cousin's fiance was there. She's like, is this Gaelic football? I've seen Gaelic football before. I was like, no, this isn't, this, no, this isn't like what you've seen before. You know, this is... <laughs> this is an that, annihilation. Yeah. 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 There's the, there is and like a... when you compare like you mentioned Monaghan Derry and you mentioned Claire Limerick and I was speaking to people who were in Ennis last week and and speaking to players as well who were playing and the players may not have felt it but by God did the players on the bench feel the atmosphere did the fans in the stadium that day feel, feel the atmosphere it was ferocious unbelievable stuff it's what you dream of and if you're a kid and you go to that game you want to go back to these games again but I feel so sorry for anyone I heard Anthony Moyes talking about it at the weekend when he brought his kids to the game like, why would you ever go back to that? Even if you're a dub, like you're even seeing out the dubs, sure they love beating Meade because of the rivalry that was there before or the rivalry that might be still there in some people's heads. But like, you get sick of that very, very quickly. Um, I do think that the massive structural inequalities which have been uh, pumped into Dublin over the last decade will result in lopsided battles like this and while it's well and good for the dubs to tell me and Kildare to get their house in order Dublin got their house in order after a massive injection of cash and I, administrative support so while Paddy has a point absolutely the, those counties are not performing to the level they should be they should both be at minimum the best teams in Division 2 every year and mostly they should be teams in Division 1 given their tradition and uh, uh, stock of clubs and playing pool, right? And given the opportunities that they have in the proximity to Dublin and the ease of which their their players can get friendly work and not have to commute the whole way across the mail. Like, both of them, both Kildare and Meath for the last decade have chronically underperformed. But the Dubs have all the advantages in the world. And so, you know, they um, when they when they give us their money, maybe we'll equal them. I feel like that's a point I would have made before but now you're too embarrassed not like, even that it's it's like kind of like there's been a lot of money pumped into meat football as well though like there has in the last five six seven eight years and i know it takes a long time for that to translate when you're talking about the money pumped into dublin you're talking 20 years ago and you know seven or eight years in you started seeing a kick or maybe even longer you started seeing a kick but but meat football fell has fallen so far in the last 10 years and and genuinely not in the last 10 years it probably fell before McIntyre came in to a, a real depth. They'd been in Division 3. Um, but the arc of teams that were in Division 3 around that time, like Monaghan rose out of Division 3 and won Ulster titles and they got the Ireland, All-Ireland semi-finals. Monaghan, they Monaghan had a smaller have, playing pool. Monaghan have also produced some of the greatest GA administrators in the history of the game and they I have think, a system in I place. Think that, I think that's very, very important. And I, I, I just think that it's, it's not just... I actually think on the pitch... Mead have got some things right over the last couple of years. I think they hit a ceiling, possibly with what they currently have, and that ceiling was probably going to come around this year, the year after. But I think the first we saw last October, November, when there was a movement to get rid of a manager, 
when it could have been done in June or July if they yeah. wanted to do it. Yeah. And there was no plan in place off the back of it. Look, and there's a lot of people saying that Andy McIntyre should have gone last October, November. There's one I last, am not one of those people. There's one last, there was no plan in place. Okay, there's one, last, one last point I want to make on this is that the, the stupidity of the championship means that some of the best players in, in those counties don't play because they know that more than likely there's an inevitability that they're going to run up against the juggernaut that is the dubs who do have their house in order and do have a, you know, mm. a, a core of All-Ireland winners who've won six to eight All-Ireland medals. And so some of the best players don't commit because they see the championship as being completely pointless. That, that's a, a truth that is universally acknowledged by almost everybody except administrators within the provincial councils who don't care about the players, as we have established. Mm. That's the like, last point I'm going to make on this. And I'm, anyway... I, no, 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 I, th- I think it's only true. Oh, go on. I, well, it's, no, if, if you're looking for crumbs of comfort on this, like I, people will say like the, the late Meath penalty, uh, the late goal they got on, on Sunday kind of puts a gloss on the scoreline. Uh, like, can we not like dig a little bit deeper into that and, and show that actually in, late in these games, teams are getting at Dublin more? Why is that? Because when Dublin run the bench more, the quality isn't there of what it was before. And we were saying that all during the league, that once you lose uh, generationally talented players, the quality will drop off. Those players still aren't there. Like they absolutely do have a 17 or 18 man panel that is as good as we've ever seen absolutely it's as good as the, the six in a row team it's when you get down to 20 to 23 where it just isn't and that is one of the reasons why I think that we, we need to just cool the jets on this a, a, a little bit now I think that me there uh, have a lot of blame to take for the, the result and the, the manner of the result at the weekend and yes part of that is, is the legacy from the grimness of the, the pure Dublin dominance of the six in a row that there's definitely a legacy issue there well no they, only, they, you know, they only beat Mayo after replays in, in some of those games well, and they only exactly. beat uh, Kerry after replay so like it, well, I'm the, talking like the 21 point win in 2020 or 20, was it 21 points Tommy or 23 points whatever it was in 2020 in, in 2020, the, the pandemic yeah. that was absolutely that was grim that was that was as grim a Dublin Mead game as I can ever remember and I think there's still a legacy of that so I, I do think there's a special case in there and yes I'm, I think Sunday was worse yeah, yes I'm reading yeah. into this too much possibly I'm reading way too much into the, the late Dublin performance because the game was done the game was done at half time so of course I'm getting I'm overstating it completely here but I just yeah, think it was, over, that, it was over on yeah but, but I just think like, but the thing is Tommy they conceded more at the weekend than they've done in any Leinster Championship game since the 2017 Leinster Final like we like no. the, the, these are like facts and also you you, ally, uh, you uh, align with that the fact that they do have ha- they have had a lot of retirements over the last couple of years the conversation we're, that we're having now feels reminiscent of the one we were having three, four years ago. And I do think the game has changed a little bit. Of course, Dublin could go, go ahead and win the All-Ireland this year. They could win it at a canter, maybe. I, I don't think that'll happen, but it, but it could happen. But I, I just think that the, the game is a little bit different from, from what it used to be. It's just I, Meath have a, have a big part to play in this as well. I, th- I, think, I, th- like, I think you're right there. I, I think this year Dublin just have to be in the mix when it comes to the All-Ireland. Because I think that... Uh, whoever the final four are I think Dublin and Kerry are going to be there I think whoever comes out of Ulster whether it's Donegal or Derry I think they're going to have a, a good chance of getting through whoever they meet in the qualifiers and then in Connacht as well I think we're going to see one of Roscommon Mayo Galway in the All-Ireland semi-finals but like you just have to be in the mix there you just have to be in the mix and the one thing about Dublin is and I think looking at their bench at the weekend they brought on Johnny Cooper they brought on Niall Scully and they brought on Paddy Small mm-hmm. and who did they bring on after that? I know, but if you are able to bring on those three boys and there's no other injuries or no other issues, you're doing okay. Did they not bring on Davy Dave Byrne after that? No, uh, let me get no, to Davy Byrne. Davy, there's word that Davy Byrne's in a bit of bother. Um, in- and there's a couple of more defensive issues that Dublin may have. I haven't got confirmation on that, but if, in- if, if Davy Byrne's in bother, yeah. If Shane Clayton and, and Brian O'Leary were the other two subs after that, who, who I hadn't seen play for Dublin before. So, so that's the thing is, Tommy, you say if they get injuries, like. Maybe they won't. Maybe the season is is uh, strung out enough for that not to happen. And maybe they'll have a lead against Kildare in the final where they can take off players. And maybe that won't happen. Maybe they'll get, be in a similar position in the quarter final and they'll go into an All Ireland semi final with a fully stacked eighteen players. And that the amount the players that you mentioned there constitute a bench pl- uh, game plan that will mm. absolutely win an All Ireland. That can absolutely win an All Ireland. It's just as they get any more pushed. I, I do I think that their, their squad thins out to the point where it'll make a significant impact. Yeah, I know I agree, but I, I think most squads are like that at the minute. I think if Kerry lose Clifford and somebody else, if uh, Mayo, as we saw, lose Tommy Conroy and Paddy Durkin, or you know, if the engine is taken out of their team, they're in serious bother. 
like when we saw Mayo and Dublin go up against each other in 2016, 2017, it was the very best of that Dublin team. And it was the very, very best Mayo team I think we've ever seen. Do you know? Yeah. The Kerry team that went up against Dublin were very were, was a very good team. It may not have been at the peak of what it was in the mid 2000s in terms of everything they had. But in in 15, that was a very, very, very good Kerry side. So I thought we th- think we saw the very best of Dublin at the start of that six in a row. Um, and even in 2019, Kerry were young and Dublin caught them, you know. So I think there are definitely clinks in the armour, but I'd be looking more, Owen, at the first half. And I'd be looking at the one three that me left behind them before Dublin, they laid a, cl- a paw on Dublin. And I think that a, a serious panic set into Mead's performance, that their game plan went out the window, because they've got memories of not scoring in the first half against Dublin in 19, and that has an impact on you. Whereas if Kildare go out there, and I'm, I hope I get you excited about this, and Ben McCormick shoots the lights out from 11, he doesn't get shut down by John Small. If Daniel Flynn has a monster of a game where he's laying ball off to Jimmy Highland, um, who's going to be the other corner forward? Derek Kerwin. Darrell Kerwin, who kicked six points the last day. Ben McCormick from centre forward, kicking you know, six points. Kildare to can do damage on the scoreboard. Meads, Meads fours just didn't click. They just weren't sharp up top the last day. I don't think they had enough up there to, to threaten Dublin. And if Dublin don't have Davy Byrne, you know, Desi Farrell was singing a tune afterwards that Byrne has a knee injury and he, he's in decent shape. But, you know, I don't think the confidence is there around the county that Davy Byrne is going to be back. Um, so, can I just do a slight tangent here 2019 All-Ireland Football Final Wikipedia page is, is quite funny Paddy Andrews gets one mention uh, in it and it's in the, the post-match section uh, Dublin goalkeeper Stephen Cluxon celebrated by taking a broom out and sweeping the changing room floor I'll just skip a couple of paragraphs here Dean Rock here Uncle Kenny and Paddy Andrews spent a week in New York Brian Fentiman on a holiday to Marbella with his girlfriend for a few days <laughs> I'll read that to him next week uh, Westmead kicked 2.15 and, and kind of without um Without any real pressure on them, and it's a weird, weird game. I watched that one too. It is a weird, it a weird game, game, and there's no yeah. atmosphere. And the game's over after Kildare put the run of points together, and Kildare have been able to put a run of points together in most of these matches. I look a, a season in Division One, a victory against the Dubs in Newbridge, all useful. But I think we might be twelve months away from actually genuinely being able to go toe to toe with a team like Dublin. And even then, I still think the the game is stacked in Dublin's favour it's going to be in Dublin's home ground like it's not they're never going to play a championship match in Newbridge or on a not in a Leinster final no you know no, no. I'm, I'm but I wonder would Kildare have kicked up a fuss if they had drawn Dublin because Kildare and Westmead both said they didn't want to play Dublin in Crow Park in a Leinster semi-final the Mead County Board did nothing about it not a word not a dicky bird there was no point like you saw with the Mead County Board did Danny McIntyre before uh, before Christmas there was no point to me management saying would you back us in this like it never happened there was never a thought of it but Kildare and Westmead at least they had a bit of fight about them they didn't want to play the dubs in Crow Park in the Leinster semi-final so it's going to happen in the Leinster semi-final there in, in, in Crow Park that is what it is but I wouldn't say a year they're a year away I would look at Derry and look at how they had a game plan in their heads you can be sure as hell that Glenn Ryan and his management team knew that they would have to play the dubs in Leinster this year. Sure, but this isn't year one of it's one. not year one of, of Roy Gallagher at all. Like you know, he, he's he's been on a yes. very long, long, slow, steady yeah. journey to get to the point where he he put the um, slow defensive style in. It that embedded last year. Obviously, there was only one championship match, so we don't know what would have happened, and um, it didn't look like the, the attacking game plan they have this year. This is year three. Like, yeah, I, I feel like Kildare though have a lot of the bodies that have been up there over the last couple of years I think Kildare this Kildare team there's a lot of lads who are at their peak physically um, I think Derry the, had a lot of work the spread is six points right and I think uh, you wouldn't be terribly surprised you're, you're looking at me going well I was just about to ask you would you take that uh, in Crow Park would you, would you, if they were beaten by a number they, that you could count no, on one hand you, you, you can't like. Uh, I'm talking as a fan I mean you're not the manager of the team you can say stuff like this I, I can't though you, you got to, you, it, pre-game the Kildare supporters can't be like oh, geez, that's grand we'll take that right they just have to get into a fight they have to be dark arts yeah. in their way through this they have to get John Small sent off they have to get uh, Costello sent off they have to rile them and do that stuff that's the type of stuff you're not supposed to say in public right mm-hmm. but like everybody knows you've got to target they've got to absolutely hammer Fenton the way Jack Barry hammers Fenton, but I don't know if Kildare can do that, right? Like, if this was if this was a, a tier one, one of your power rankings top four teams preparing for Dublin, they would be like, how do we make them as angry and as pissed off as possible so that they're distracted from what they're doing? How do we make the the ones who don't have the five All Irelands be like, do I really deserve my place in this team? What are you whispering in their ear when you're going out to see them? Mm. You're pretty lucky to be in this team, aren't you? 
you're not good. You're you're not as good as the rest of the team. Like the type of stuff that we know goes on in GAA matches. I I look at Glenn Ryan and I think he's doing some of that stuff. Yeah, you know, he definitely believes. He he, de- he definitely believes that that uh, Kildare have to be targeting this game as an opportunity for silverware and Dublin are like collateral but, damage on on that journey. You know, that's uh, definitely the way he's looking at it. But Dublin I, Dublin aren't in any way showing any of the weaknesses that they showed last year. Like they just aren't. Their best players are in form. Yeah. But it doesn't yeah. matter. Well, it, it, I, doesn't, it doesn't matter yeah. that they haven't had the challenge. Their best players are in form. And are they, they though? Yeah, they are. Like, Fenton is playing well. Well, hold, hold on. Yeah, just to support that point, to, like, Tommy, they have had exactly the same path as last year. It was Wexford yeah. in Wexford Park, me yeah. in Croke Park, and they've won both of those games in a far more convincing fashion than they won those games last year. So true, I think that, like, true. they, you know, it's, you're, you're, you are comparing like with like. I do think they're in a better place, though. There was a serious hangover last year from the training um, incident when they were caught in Ennis Fails and they were in the front of the paper and Desi Farrell was made to take the rap for it and Stephen Cluxon walked away around the same time I think there was a serious hangover about that yeah there's none and of that this year clarity yeah, uh, clarity of purpose I, clarity I, of thought Conor Callan fit Conor Callan fit they're in a better place but Conor Callan was at one on one with Owen Harkin at the weekend Physically, I don't think Owen Harkin, Owen Harkin is a very good defender. Physically, I don't think he's he's able to cope with with Conor Callaghan. I think Kildare have defenders who can go man for man with Conor Callaghan as long as he doesn't burn them for a goal. I think, Jerry, what you were saying there about the physicality, and I'm not going to comment on getting players sent off or getting stuck in in that way, but what Kildare need in that first 10-15 minutes is to get that power and energy from their supporters behind them. Because Kildare people at the minute, there's a buzz about the county. I felt that at Newbridge, it was one of the, the best GA games I was at in a long time because of the atmosphere and the ferociousness of it, of that game in Newbridge, and the feeling afterwards, the energy that was there. That is tangible and it's real, and it's behind Kildare football at the minute. Yeah. And they need that to come with them they do. in the first 15, 20 minutes against Dublin. Because last year, it felt like they were going out to make sure that Jack O'Connor didn't get hammered by 20 points yeah. that's what it felt like yeah, and totally. they lost by 8 and it felt like it was 20 it and, was, it was, there was nothing and, to hold on to and, and you know what it, it was that attitude would you accept that right and I don't mean I mean mm. just because you're from Kerry you're, you're getting tired of this brush but it was that oh what's the spread oh, we might be able to beat that there's no mm. special prize for beating the spread yeah. none all that happens is that people see through you that's what happens if you go out and all you're interested in is damage limitation people see through you Jerry O'Malley says, Kildare haven't beaten a top team in the championship other than uh, nowhere in Newbridge game in 22 years, he says. Kildare have beaten Dubs one Leinster final in 94 years, two victories over the Dubs in 50 years for Kildare. Jerry O'Malley again says, Kildare have a dreadful defence. Mayo should have scored seven goals against them in the league. If Kildare don't play with sweepers, it's a 15-point hammering plus. But Jerry has a point with the second one there. Uh, I think the first one, when it comes to history and matches, and, and I wouldn't really read too much into that, but... The first one about a defence, I think I do think Kildare need to sacrifice one of their players. They have four scoring forwards. They have Paul Cribben who can score from 40 yards, no problem whatsoever, kick three points if he has to. I think that number 10 position needs to be somebody who will plug a hole and will engage with the Dublin shooters when they're in and around the D. Not sit back in the 21 like Monaghan got caught against Derry, but engage with the Dublin shooters in and around the D. They need to have somebody there who's going to cause a bit of havoc. Right, very quickly, your first, our first road show in uh, yeah. three years is nearly here. The football pod have added a Mayo legend to the lineup. When are you going to do the big reveal? I nearly reveal him there by accident. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're going to reveal it Monday morning. So Monday morning, there's going to be a big kick. Uh, Mayo are going to get their qualifier draw. Hopefully, they're going to get Tyrone pulled out of the hat. And it's going to be a bit of a buzz back in the county because, God, when you, when you lose a provincial, or provincial game to, to Galway, quarterfinal, it's a long wait to get back. It is, but, but it's, I was it's, speaking, it's their path was, to an all Ireland final, right? We just know this. Yeah. I was speaking to the Mayo, uh, the Mayo News football podcast during the week. We, we had a wee chat about the live show and a bit of a chat about the old years between Mayo and me, Don, you've obviously done the documentary about the brawl and a bit of that came up. And But we got talking again about the buzz that can happen and the hope that's there in the county and how lucky Mayo people are to actually be able to get excited about football and they will get excited once that draw is announced on Monday. So um, we're going to be there it's going to be the Thursday, which is the weekend after the provincial finals, the Fordham, and it's the weekend before that first round of the qualifiers. So I think there's seven Touch and Cup games the weekend before as well. So it's going to be a sensational week of football. It's going to be really heating up. Summer starting. We can't wait for it. First Mayo legend announced on Monday. 
and hopefully we'll have a second one announced a few days after that. You can give out to uh, Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue for all the damage that they inflicted on your <laughs> county live and in person at the Royal Theatre in Castlebar on Thursday, June the 2nd. Tickets are available now, otbsports.com forward slash events for more. Tommy, good stuff. Thanks a million. Thanks, lads. Best of luck over the next two weeks getting what, ready for Dublin. What was the strain like on your whoop in over, over beyond in New York? Uh, the strain, I'll talk about the... St- well, the Got a lot of steps in, and you know it, it, it's. You it's, do a lot of walking. You're, a lot of walking. You know, we we uh, exactly. I tell you what, the strain was last night. Uh, hey, training oh. last night, and um, <laughs> I had football training last night. A couple of days after coming back, and uh, what was it? The max heart rate was. I was in serious bother. I think for about forty-five minutes last night. So nice to get that one out of the system. Very good. Very good. All right. Tommy, I have to get swimming, Jer. Yeah. This bloody triathlon. I have to get swimming. Talk right. soon. Bye bye. Speaking of which, right, we are uh, we are doing. Some of us are doing the the me and Tommy and oh oh no, some some phantom excuse was made up. Hurling next year, hurling from the ditch. Next year, professionally. Have you just decided you're not going to do this ever? It's yeah. not for you. Yeah, basically. Is that because an old man humiliated you? Yeah, on that's the bike. a long time ago. That's a long time ago. You're a much better cyclist now. No, I'm just. You're like, a better I'm, human. I'm now. just cycling longer distances now. I'm still going as slow as ever. But that'd be okay. It's yeah. not. It's not a race, except when it was actually a race. Except when it was actually a race. Yeah. You lost twenty. Yeah, over twenty kilometers. That's that's what I say. Over twenty kilometers. If you just give me like one more kilometer, I would have caught you again. Um. Well, we that's could do. We works. could do a sixty k if you want. Yeah. No, let's not. I I I was saying that we should do one of those um, Tour de France stages. You can go up the. Alpe d'Huez. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. Sign me up for that. Uh, no, we should do this thing where, like, I mean, we just get a medal for finishing and nobody counts your time. They do that. Participation medal. Yeah. They, they do that at all triathlons. They actually do that. Yeah. That's how that works. Except, we, we except just... the one thing we did was, like, an actual <laughs> race. Well, we just turned it into a race so that there would be some interest in it, as opposed to, like, you know, the, the whole point of doing the triathlon is that you're racing against yourself. Yeah. You, you're, you, you know, I you're like Jack Nicholson. You, you want to be a better man. Yeah. Or a woman, obviously. Yeah, I felt, I felt uh, like a significantly worse human being after it. It's because we had pints the night before. Right. It's true. The whole point of this is we are doing uh, triathlon and it's hurtling towards us very quickly. It's the bank holiday weekend. And during the break, you're going to hear from the race director, John Walnuts. He was on the show uh, last Friday, ahead of our show, ahead of our participation. Uh, it's all in partnership with Whoop, the personalized digital fitness and health coach that helps you unlock your inner potential. Check out whoop.com for more. We're back after these talking about the uh, fourth episode of Have You Seen with Joseph Conroy, which is actually the Alex Ferguson documentary. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. This is Sport Ireland Campus. And here is where it all starts. From the little ones learning to the high performance athletes leading. Here we go to play, to practice, to progress. Here is where communities in the nation come together to compete, to win, and to belong. Here we go to the next level, then on to the world stage. This is Sport Ireland Campus, and here we go. Visit sportirelandcampus.ie to be a part of it. I don't know if you know this, John, but one of us, who shall remain nameless, Adrian Barry, is just doing the swim. It's 250 metres. I was saying you can basically pretend that you're like a cork bobbing down the river because the current in the river is going to take you downstream. Yeah, I, like I, I saw your I saw your clip with regard to um, uh, Mr. O'Driscoll as well, and sort of like faking that he couldn't swim. I, 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 again, we could put him in a wetsuit and we'd just push him off the edge. A few points, yeah. eventually. Um, and claiming he can't run is, you know, it's it's a bit unfair to say that. But in general, look, I, I think the fun factor here is that people. I, I'd be very surprised if anyone who does a section of the triathlon is not regretting the fact that they didn't give another part a go by the end of the day. Um, Because I think what they'll see out there is uh, these are not super, super fit people. Like it's, it's sort of, we have a very wide um, cohort that come, that can be fit, unfit, old, young, uh, as I say, male, female, all sort of ages um, and all types of ability and all types of bikes that they get on. Um, it is not one of these super, super competitive events. Um, it, it's the tri event, uh, the sprint event in particular, those those two in triathlon are, are generally um, populated by, I'd say 50 to 60% will be either doing their first triathlon or first They'll have done many park runs or cycles, but it'll be their first time putting all three together. So there'll be a lot of people out there just out there to enjoy it. There'll be, you know, 50 or 60 off the front end who will be racing. Um, but other than that, it'll be, it'll be more fun than, than anything else. 
FBD Insurance knows this sound spells trouble for van drivers. But if you're an existing FBD customer, you'll get 15% off a new van insurance policy. It's how we're keeping you and your van on the road. Visit fbd.ie or contact your local branch. FBD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. Terms and conditions apply. 15% discount available on new commercial motor policies only when an existing FBD farm, business, car or home policy is in place. FBD Insurance Group Limited, trading as FBD Insurance, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Commercial motor insurance is underwritten by FBD Insurance PLC. The team of OTB are taking on a challenge. A challenge that requires fitness. A challenge that demands months of training and preparation. A challenge that requires knowing when to push and when to focus on recovery. Triathlons aren't easy, but having a fitness coach helps. Whoop! For helping us non-athletes. You need all the help you can get. Yeah, yeah, as I was saying, helping us non-athletes feel like pros in our challenge to complete a triathlon this summer. OTB Sports, in partnership with Whoop. Unlock your inner potential with Whoop, the personalized digital fitness and health coach that provides you with actionable feedback on your sleep, training, recovery and health. Check out whoop.com for more. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Jerry O'Malley says, I hope Kildare win. Big fan of Kerwin, a class act, but the defence seems to give up so many goal chances. If Kildare could play with a sweeper, even two, keep the front three up, hit the dubs on the break like Donegal in 2014. I mean, it sounds, in theory, like, let's just do what Dudley Gold did in 2014. Unfortunately, it turns out most teams have been trying to do that to them since. With the casual exception of Mayo, who never tried to copy Dudley Gold, they were just going to be Mayo the whole way through. Yeah, and it, it, it worked to a point. Yeah. Until, like, 2019, when it got absolutely shredded. Um, but it never for, worked to the point of victory. No, but, I mean, it was as close as anybody came to something working against Dublin. So I think that they... But Jim McGuinness has won in All-Ireland with that Mayo team. Oh, there's a good question. I think possibly, yeah. I think possibly. There's a second sentence, I presume. <laughs> well, I, 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 like, I think that uh, James Horne, and I think actually, to be fair, Rochford, and even the Holmes and Kennelly year, um, I think you can all say that those years went particularly well for those managers, and they've all done pretty good jobs with a team that, at one point or another, were written off by a lot of people so I think that the managers that were there deserve huge credit for taking them there but would Jim McGuinness have just decided you know what going kamikaze against Dublin in the 17 final isn't actually the way to do it and maybe go kamikaze for a section of the game I, I, I don't know but I think possibly there's, there's, um, there, there is a, a, a weird world where, where he would have actually beaten them with that Mayo team but then again like his, his Mayo his Donegal teams rather had outstanding players team, uh, players that were on a par with Mayo if not better as we saw in 2012 when the teams actually played each other in, in the most important game between the sides so I'm not sure is the quality of that Mayo team actually better than the Donegal team when he won the All-Ireland with them yeah, my, okay. my my initial gut feeling was yes it is yes but those Mayo players were better but yeah, it turned out they weren't then I kind of like I talked out loud for a while and in my head I realised <laughs> okay, okay, that actually exactly. they're not actually you should do this offer then yeah. instead 20 minutes past 8 this morning not to uh, give you the head start it's 20 minutes past 8 this morning Joseph Conroy is with us for this week's edition of Have You Seen <laughs> Joseph, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Jerry Nowen. How you getting on? Yeah, very good. This week we're looking at Sir Alex Ferguson. Alex Ferguson, never give in. Never give in. Probably start with at the top here. And um, have you guys actually seen this? And on paper, what are your kind of interest levels in a feature length Amazon Prime Alex Ferguson documentary? Uh, I have seen uh, the first hour of it, um, and it took me about a year of having Amazon to go, I'll watch this. I probably will watch this. And then I got into it and I was like, this is really good for what it is. Uh, there's there's like an opening bit where I found out stuff that I didn't really know. I didn't know anything really about his time at Rangers and how horrific his takeaways from that period were and how formative they were. And also I knew nothing about his relationship with the brother and why two of them basically traveled the world because his brother ends up as a chief scout and chief conciliary, or certainly uh, an important conciliary in the, um, during the Man United period too. So the bit where he fell out with his dad about football and then makes up with him because he scores a hat-trick, he's like, well, okay, this is, uh, I, I begin to learn a lot about the man right here. Yeah, after about seven or eight months of not speaking to his dad, he scores a hat-trick against uh, Rangers. Um, and his dad comes up to him and goes, put it there, a boy, that's my boy. I knew you had it in you. And it's all fixed. But yeah, that is kind of a good starting off point into the weird sort of 
the strange psychology of Alex Ferguson and the Fergusons. But um, yeah, like you said, I kind of approached this a bit kind of not super enthusiastic about it. Like I only watched it this week. Again, haven't had it there available to me for a year, sitting on Amazon Prime, waiting for you to watch. But um, I don't know, it just kind of had never felt like the right moment. But um, then once I did sit down, there is great stuff in it, especially kind of like the kind of hook is this is his first major kind of documentation and comment on uh, his recovery from his brain hemorrhage. And you kind of get some of the some new detail on that. Like just one point where a doctor saying at some point, at one point, his survival chances were 80, 20. 20 percent chance of survival so that's all really interesting and like you said the kind of formative years the ranger stuff the aberdeen stuff and uh, we kind of get this stark cut off at the treble and that's all done really well but also kind of i don't know the treble cut off left me feeling a bit unfulfilled which is maybe a little bit unfair like we're kind of this is very good for what it is we might talk a little bit about what it isn't and a bit of the context around it. Is there any possibility there's a second part coming where the juicy stuff gets released perhaps after his death? I don't know. Or is it like the type of thing that you can say in your 80s now? It's like, wow, well, never really liked Glazers. Yeah, shouldn't have, shouldn't have fallen out with the Irish lads. Especially especially Roy. Of all, you know, I just, I really love Ireland, but I just seem to have a problem with, um, you know, the big personalities from there. That's why I found my relationship with Mick McCarthy was always pretty straightforward. <laughs> as far as I know, maybe there are meetings going on where it's like, all right, we've kind of done the formative of years, we've done the win the treble. What's in part two, guys? Um, I'm not sure how enthusiastic they'd be. Well, actually, you're actually, in fairness, he's left like a Champions League and like God knows how many Premier Leagues on the cutting floor there. So I don't know, maybe there will be a part two. But if I was kind of pitching my fantasy Ferguson documentary, it would kind of follow an arc of Rocky Gibraltar, uh, breaking up with Roy Keane, the Glazer takeover, life under the Glazers when he wins five titles, a Champions League, gets two Champions League finals, and then kind of the kind of whole question around succession planning and sort of the fall of the club after he leaves. Like, I think that'd be a pretty interesting documentary. The uh, the Rocky Gibraltar element of it is, is always qu- quite um, a contradiction in itself because Ferguson has always said that the reason one of the reasons why he's interested in horse racing is because it takes him away from football and that nobody bothers you everybody asks you who's going to win the half three rather than how are Manchester United going of course if you were watching uh, Punchestown and RT a couple of weeks ago uh, he got pulled aside for an interview and was like how will uh, the new manager do at, at Manchester United so um, the, it's possibly not always the case but I wonder I mean did, did he did he kind of realise the, the irony of it all where late on his involvement in a horse essentially had a massive knock-on impact on the course of Manchester United, or or so it seemed from the outside anyway, that I guess the, the, the current predicament of Manchester United and the current hatred that a lot of United fans have for their owners can be traced back to Man- Alex Ferguson's involvement in, in a horse. It may, it may be too simplistic to put it like that, but it definitely seems that there was a, a huge part to play. Yeah, because just to kind of relitigate it slightly... He's involved with Rocket Gibraltar. He's getting a share of the prize money. When it comes to the... Just explain that, because for people right. who are kind of like, what, what what are you talking about? Rocket Gibraltar is a horse. Yeah. And he seems to have had this... He had this agreement where he was getting part of the prize money. But then when it came to the... So the prize money was kind of a few million pounds. Well, that, so, then when it came to the... Ro- sorry, yeah. Rocket Gibraltar is a, is a horse, and it's, um, it's owned by Coolmore. And... Ferguson is mates with them. They go racing. They're friends. They they hang out. High achievers. I, I you know at the very highest level of business and sport, it looked like this intoxicating mix of, you know, a Mount Rushmore style night out would be with uh, McManus, Magnier, Ferguson, and whoever else. Like maybe Ed O'Brien gets into that group, possibly, but he might not. Do you know the three lads are older? They're kind of similar vintage. They have similar levels of respect for each other, and they're like, here, we give you a horse. Uh, this one it should be good not great and then it turns out Rocket Gibraltar is astonishingly good like astonishingly good as a horse right but the deal is that we know publicly Ferguson's the owner of the horse and so if you own a horse you automatically feel like you have the breeding rights to the horse you, you said a very important thing there Joseph the prize money it was a share of the prize money that he was getting Ferguson thought that he was getting a share yeah. of the horse, 
not the prize money not like a so if if we if we for example were to own a horse that's off the ball we wouldn't get the breeding rights to the horse we'd get a little bit of share of the prize money we'd give it to charity that would be how that would work right there was no sense that this was like a you'll be the front for this it'll be a marketing tool for Coolmore and you'll give the money to charity it's like you know, this is a good, good, good opportunity for us all to do a bit of business together Rising Tide lifts all boats to the point where and the, the breeding rights for some horses like Sadler's Wells Sadler's Wells could have made 250 million at stud over his life or more so you're talking about bear in mind Ferguson wasn't the highest paid employee at Manchester United his players were earning significantly more than him at this point. He was not a wealthy man by the standards of Jose Mourinho or the Atletico Madrid manager now or Pep Guardiola. He was not getting paid that level of money. He wasn't getting paid the same money as Eric Cantona, I don't think, at, at, um, when Cantona was at the club. So the lads come, billionaires, are very rich anyway, and are like, you can, have it, you can have this horse. And he's like, wow. But then obviously there was some dispute about whether or not the breeding rights were going to be included. So that's where we picked the story up, yeah. Joe. Yeah, and you're talking about the figure that's kind of always quoted is a potential 200 million pounds on the table and a potential half of that obviously is 100 million. So that all gets nasty. Uh, there's a great quote here from uh, Keane's second book, just um, giving his sympathetic take on the whole controversy. Uh, this is him on Ferguson. He was just a mascot for them, walking around with, with the Rockford Volter. Hey, look at me, how big I am. I didn't even own the bloody thing. That's kind of, this kind of leads to this rift. This work kind of just something we haven't pointed out here is the two Irish guys here own kind of between 25 and 30% of Manchester United. So that's kind of where things get interesting. And also kind of say that the popular narrative is that the Rocket Gibraltar split creates a rift between the Irish uh, block and Man United and they eventually sell off their shares to the Glazers. I was a bit like, is that an oversimplification? Where the Glazers kind of coming in the back door, they're already buying up shares anyway. But the more you look at it, the more that this argument either accelerated or caused or created the opportunity for the Glazers to get in. But um, so during that rift, the Irish guys go off, they hire a firm to come in and kind of do some sort of forensic style accounting uh, over United's numbers. And they come back to the United board. So this, this is a major shareholder coming back with a dossier with 99 questions that they want answered by the club. So this is kind of where we get the link into the documentary because this documentary is a Jason Ferguson production directed by Jason Ferguson, um, who is the son of Alex Ferguson, who at that time had kind of left behind a career in TV productions to become a football agent. So you've got him working as an agent. His dad's the manager of Man United. Major shareholders coming in with these 99 questions about the club's transfer dealings. I'm just going to refer here to a piece by Matt Sater in The Athletic, just to some of the details of those 99 questions. So they centred on whether uh, allegations that Ferguson had let his son become the club's in-fact agent and United had been overpaying for players. The, uh, the board then promised an internal review. The results of that review were never published and Jason Ferguson wasn't found guilty of any wrongdoing. What did happen was the BBC picked up the story, put out this kind of this kind of eccentric documentary called Ferguson and Sons, where it's kind of like dispatches, but made for Generation X with um, kind of Stone Rose style beats playing under everything. And like while they're regaling stories about Jason Ferguson, they have an actor with like a massive foam head and like a Nokia up to his ear walking around outside Manchester United, mimicking, making all these deals. Um, so that's actually what leads to the seven years between Ferguson and the BBC. After that documentary, Ferguson speaks to the BBC for almost eight years. Uh, but the eventual fallout of that was right before that documentary airs, United come out and say, they never published the full details report, but they said that they were would not be doing future dealings with Jason uh, Ferguson, and that firm was wound down. Um, United did actually deal with him again down the line, because after Ferguson retired, Jason Ferguson, his director producer, also becomes his agent and kind of works on deals between him and the club. So just kind of when you're watching a documentary like this, which which we're saying is great for what it is, it's also kind of great for what it isn't as well. When you look at the full context of sort of who's crafting this and who's putting it together and 
even uh, there was an interesting interview with Jason where he was saying kind of on the first day of filming, he was ready to sort of map things out and say, all right, dad, we're doing this, this, this. Uh, he turns on the camera and he says, Alex just starts speaking for 20 minutes straight, uninterrupted monologue on his childhood. So there's a lot of interesting power dynamics going on here. And also I think the documentary is actually more interesting when you take into account who's telling the story and how the story is being told. This is like a, a mini succession, isn't it? Or like who who actually made this documentary? You know, who is who is the, 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 the person with the power when the, it looks like the, the children are making this documentary? Actually, it's the the elder statesman of the family, really, who's calling the shots. And I mean, it's, and it's know, not very surprising. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely like he's got to be happy with the end product. He's absolutely going to be happy with the end product. And like, look, it's it's very it's very difficult to do full justice to to Ferguson. Like, what a titanic character, and what a massively flawed character, and what a genius at the same time. So how do you how do you like this is his side. This is his. This is his last dance. It, it, well, it, it, yeah. Except it's 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 too short. Do you know? Yeah. Like, I I think if he'd gone full last dance it would have been amazing because they could have had Keen. they could have just used the clips of Keen at the Cadbury's Roadshow in the Borgosh saying stuff and they could have shown him that and he could have been nah it's just bollocks nah that would have been amazing and it, like I think they did miss a trick with that stuff definitely and I think they missed a trick with the Rocket Gibraltar stuff as well because like he's he's talked about oh that did not distract me at all Um, just just to, to put a little bit of context on Rocket Gibraltar, right? I, I'm, I'm on his page on the Coolmore Stud. Um, he's only, it's only five grand to get a cover now. It should be 50, 100, maybe 250 if he was an absolute superstar stallion. But a dual Group 1 winning juvenile and then five-time Group 1 winning three-year-old resulting in him becoming the first horse ever to win seven consecutive Group 1s in the Northern Hemisphere, breaking Millreef's 30-year-old record. So when that happened... When that happened, the excitement levels about what this horse's kids were going to be able to do was off the charts. So the battle was for a huge amount of life-changing, empire-building cash. And, um, yeah. Naturally, things get a bit poisonous around that, as as you'd expect them to. And um, like, I wonder, did we ever get a sense of what the 99 questions were? Did they get any answers to them? Are they published anywhere? They, the, the United Board said that they, they investigated, they weren't going to answer, and then very quickly afterwards, the Glazers came in and that all, that all disappeared. Yeah, okay. Now, like, this is only part one of Ferguson's career where there was some talk around the time of him retiring. Yeah. You know, like, like, and then he comes back and wins, as you've said, five Premier League titles and a Champions League. Like, that force of power, when he wasn't distracted anymore, you know, reaches two other Champions League finals, as, as Joseph said. Like, the horse is this massive hinge point in, in the whole narrative. And then he has to go again and he's like, oh, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. And manages to work with the Glazers. Like, it's mad. The, the success level is, is off the charts. And I think the documentary does a reasonable job of like, we didn't talk about the Aberdeen stuff where they're training in car parks and they're training in public parks and like, um, that team beats Real Madrid. You know, it's not nothing. They beat Real Madrid in a cup final. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And maybe just to give a taste of um, kind of the type of thing we do get, there was, we had two clips lined up here. So I got to the second one, which is him speaking. This is just after Aberdeen have won the Cup Winners' Cup beating Real Madrid. And they've gone and beat Majors 1 0 in kind of a drab, unconvincing Scottish Cup final. And um, here's kind of an example of the great archive that you do get in this piece, which is great for what it is. Ferguson, many congratulations winning the Scottish Cup for the second year, but it was close. The luckiest team in the world. They were a disgrace of performance. Were you surprised by the way that Rangers Norm, played? Norm McQuish won a cup for Aberdeen. Norm, Norm McQuish played Rangers themselves. They were a disgrace of performance. The Amoke and winning cups doesn't matter. Their standards have been set long ago and they're not going to accept that from any Aberdeen team. There's no way to be to any glory from that. Can you give a reason for the disappointing performance then? Ah, uh, uh, could you? If you could open up their minds, you'd be able to find out. I can't understand why I did it. The only thing I can think of was that I wanted this to be the moment when we 
We set ourselves as the best team Scotland ever had. In all honesty, was it about being the best team in Scotland or was it about hammering Rangers? I think it was probably about being Rangers. And this was my moment to say, right, you're going to get it. I wanted to put the knife in them. I mean, I don't think any of us are to, too surprised to say here that revenge is a very important driving factor in his career. And, it, like, and you know, there's a nastiness and a ruthlessness that comes with that that turns him into the great football manager that he is. But that, that is, you know, that's a, a troublesome character trait. Yeah, it's like it's one as well that kind of like puts sort of reconciliation beyond the bounds of possibility. You you find it's it's, it's kind of pointless, isn't it? Like, you, you, why would you reconcile with somebody when that's not the whole point of your existence? Is not to be friends with them. It's to use them as part of your success. And and it's a transaction. You you paid. They he paid Keane. Keane took the money. Keane took the glory. And he used Ferguson to win trophies as well and build his reputation. Like it's, it's totally transactional, I think. And let's not also forget that Ferguson, I'm sure, feels that it paid off in the end. He won. Yeah. The the, the, the sort of chip in his shoulder that, that he would have had, and let's not forget Roy Keane absolutely had it as well. And Keane, well, that Keane precedes, would say it was worth it too. Yeah, that precedes, as as Joe mentioned, a, a huge wave of success for Manchester United that came post Roy Keane. That that sparked possibly Alex Ferguson's greatest Manchester United team. And uh, I, I think that every decision he's made is he probably feels is, is, is vindicated. Yeah, and you're looking at things being transactional there. What's really interesting is you see in the documentary him kind of bringing the club back to the top table, winning that first league title. But with the treble and everything else, he's kind of built that empire that then has been sold off to the Glazers. Like there's another, like that's kind of what I find frustrating is I think kind of there's that sort of heart of darkness and that sort of like kind of, that, that that kind of just metal underneath that you kind of want to see that you don't really see here. Like, I'd find Roy Keane speaking about Alex Ferguson at the roadshow back and forth, gosh, a lot more captivating than what you're getting here. And even little moments like this, we've got another clip here. This is 2013, so a good bit down the road from the initial Rockets Rebosa controversy you're speaking about there, but he's talking to Jon Snow uh, for Channel 4, and he brings up He's kind of, he's on this sort of like, oh yeah, I'm here chatting to Jon Snow. Um, politics, oh yeah, I'd be, I'd be left of labour. Um, then John kind of has him kind of lulled in, this nice flow. Then he starts kind of, he starts bringing up um, a few topics that Ferguson's a bit less comfortable with. But um, I, we'll just play you this. This is him bringing up the BBC documentary that we mentioned before. I didn't hold grudges. The Vents would always come back in. Well, that's true, but you held a very long grudge with the BBC because they, they, they talked about your son and there was something to talk about with your son. Yeah, I mean, right. he, was, no. he was somewhere in the furniture of the agencies that were dealing with the club and that probably wasn't a good idea. No, he, he was an agent for about a year and a half and give up. That's it. But that's the bit the BBC concentrated on. They concentrated, and if you, if you actually watch, it was a pure, pure documentary of paper bags and all that on. I mean, it was, it was horrible, so... But you chucked them out for seven years? Yeah. Well, they, they never tried to... They never apologised, that's your problem. But it's another aspect of control, isn't it? Yeah, but the, the, the important thing is you have to have some sort of strength of principle about dealing with that. I didn't enjoy it. I don't think it was correct, it wasn't accurate, and it wasn't honest. And that's, in a way, why you like the Glazers, because they've left you with control. They don't really control the club, you do. But they're supportive. That's the important thing. I think that you always appreciate people who support you. And they've been very good. And uh, they're very... Um, everything they've asked for, have, they've delivered. Yeah, so he, he was happy to work with the Glazers. And, like, look, he, he made the Glazers thing work. Mm. Well, yeah, he, like he did. I mean, the, the trophies speak for themselves. It, it, I'm always fascinated by people who are kind of are worried to admit that they do hold grudges, uh, even though it's like patently obvious to everyone. It's like, oh, I didn't hold a grudge against BBC. <laughs> I mean, there was absolutely not, like... I, yeah, they were. Um, it's like, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's great. There's, there's a great follow-up on that where they continue talking about the Glazers and it's like, um, you just tell me that you're uh, a socialist and left of Labour. Um, We've also said that um, 
like I can't really use the phrase, it's, it's not Cowboy Capitalist, but in the sense that the, Glazer, that the Glazers are like hyper capitalist, how do you marry them off? And he's kind of like, oh, you know, that's um, that's business. And he's like, yeah, and these loans against the 12, he's like, ah, people talk about the loans. That's, that's business. People, people, people got to understand this. So, yeah, this is kind of like, I think it's, it's a bit incredible just watching the piece. I think it's definitely worth kind of reading up a bit on the whole kind of Jason Ferguson dynamic, even we've, we've spoken about Roy Keane there, that kind of 25 minute crescendo of him sort of speaking about Man United to us at the Borgers Henry Theatre and why he wouldn't apologise to Alex Ferguson. Um, that ends with him talking about kind of nepotism and and sort of all the, all, all these kind of involvements. So they're, they're obviously, it's obviously a team, like it's, it's, it's what Keane went to there at his most kind of pain putting out of his end, out of his head. Yeah, uh, angry at the, at the end of that segment. Like so, I don't know. I think like one, the documentary is good for what it is. Two, I'd recommend a bit of um, googling around Jason Ferguson afterwards. Cool. All right. Good stuff, Joseph. Thanks a million. Cheers. It's uh, Joseph Conroy giving us uh, the recommendation to watch it. The gold is in the pre-Manchester United stuff. Right. Time for the papers. Eight forty-two. There are so many idiots out there. So many spoofers. There's a lot of horse. I think he's a total spoofer. What do you mean a spoofer? He's a bullshit. Ah, no, I'm a, come on, don't, don't be, no, I'm not. Yes. No. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Quick look at the papers. Uh, loads of the boxers, obviously. Uh, two through two World Championship finals on the back page. Over the moon, Amy and Lisa shine. This is the sun. Over and over. Tuchel Cup final. Not the first time Christensen cried off. So uh, things have gone pear-shaped there. The front of the sun is Vardy's to flee the UK. Under fire, Becky will move to the US. Battled Rebecca Vardy will quit the UK with footballer husband Jamie in the wake of her disastrous wag at the Christie libel trial. Just when we thought the UK couldn't get any worse, it loses one of its greatest assets. The couple plan to move to the US regardless of the result. A, spo- a source said of Rebecca, she's keen to be out of the country as fast as possible. Can we believe any of the stories about the wags in the papers anymore when we know that there are dark forces leaking? Can we believe it? Is it is it believable? Mm. How do we know the truth about Rebecca Vardy's plans for the future? How can they? How can we continue in this world? What papers that in again? It's in the sun. Didn't the sun come up in the whole thing? They, I would say I would. They are well to, sourced, though. I, I would. I was just about to say the sun is the Rebecca Vardy Bible. Yeah. I, like I, I wouldn't. I would uh, trust. I, I do, don't trust anything more in my entire life than the sun getting Rebecca Vardy details correct from her perspective. Wayne, Jamie's a bottler. This is the this is the page page five. The two lads. Wayne Rooney furiously branded Jamie Vardy a butler last night as the former England teammates Wagga the Christie fallout erupted again. They they should get the gloves on, shouldn't they? They're the same age. Rooney's thirty six and Vardy's thirty five. Anyway, sorry, John Logan is here. We should How are you done? Jaron Owen, how are we doing? Are you uh, are you team Vardy or team Rooney? This is Abbey Leaks, lads. This is something I've just completely bypassed. <laughs> the traffic in Abbey Leaks was absolutely shocking for years. Is the bypass finished? They've just moved all the traffic to Maynooth now, haven't they? Have they? Jesus. So I don't know. Maybe I should have paid attention to it, but I just said no. Nah. What's We're... your gut feeling? Who do you want to win if you had to... You know, uh, wait, uh, uh, we, should do a sweep, we should do an office sweep second. Who's going to win? Wayne Rooney. I'm a Wayne Rooney man. Yeah, I think uh, I'm Team Rooney all the way here. Team Rooney, I think. Are you Vardy? You're you're a Vardyite, a Vardonian. Well, I think Vardy deserves credit for making the, the greatest story of our generation. But I think uh, when you boil it down to the serious business, I think Rooney, Rooney for me. Okay, uh, text us in. Uh, our poll is live. It's not live. We haven't got a poll live. Uh, OTBM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. The PGA Tour, um, uh, PGA Championship this week, gone. Yeah. Can't wait for this, lads. This is the bit where. All of your all of your bets are winning, uh, except your Brooks Kepko ones. No, sorry, your Bryson DeChambeau ones. Yeah, I'll never tip him anyway because I think he's he's mangled his body, and um, he's got a wrist injury and he's out. Did a strange interview, um, looking for second chances. I don't know what the hell that was about. He's an enigma. Yeah, yeah. I wonder was he was he injured that whole time? Yeah, it's a, you can never tell with the golf, can you? You can't because the PGA Tour are, are living in the 17th century in terms of suspensions and that. So we got Rory McIlroy, Jordan Spieth, who's going for a career Grand Slam, and Tiger. First two days in the same group, going to be box office television. Patrick Harrington's in there, Seamus Power's in there, and Shane Lowry, happy enough that he's um, 
got the game that might be required for Southern Hills because they've taken a lot of the trees out of the course. Um, it's going to be a lot more windy then in Oklahoma. It's going to be a windy week. And you need to be able to chip around the greens because they've kind of taken a bit of the rough they've uh, out of the uh, complexes around the greens. So you're going to have to be able to chip well. And that might not work in the favour of Victor Hovland, for example, but Shane Larry, I think. It'd be interesting to see what the Masters, that experience of the Saturday when he kind of had that meltdown and um, and finishing so close and then the triple bogey on Sunday does for his uh, kind of equilibrium in terms of if he's in touch again to try and win this tournament on Sunday night. We know that McElroy's eight years without a major. He's already won the PGA twice and he's playing very well, Rory. Um, will the win suit him because he's very, very much a high ball hitter. Um, but his, his beautiful around the greens, he's putting better. And uh, I think his irons have improved. So uh, I just can't wait for this, lads. It, it's a very, very deep field over the 100 top golfers, 156 players, you're going to get surprise names up there. And that's even more of the beauty of it, you know? Yeah, well, uh, there's a picture of John Daly practising. Ah, uh, John Daly, who met my sister. Um, or my sister met him, rather. She got a... a that's so the way it goes, yeah. Yeah, yeah she, she got this... She went to... At Augusta, she went to his truck and she got loads of T-shirts signed and everything. I put it up on Twitter there a while ago. So, uh, yeah, what a charismatic guy. I remember 1991, um, he drove all night. He was first reserve. Like, Denny McCarthy is the guy who got into the tournament. Um, he's been a regular virtual insanity in, in place of Bryson Shambo. In 1991, John Daly was first reserve, drove all night through a couple of states from Arkansas to Indiana and went and won the tournament. Rip it and rip it. I remember he was doing this down the 18th, if anybody remembers. Uh, seen on was he the 8th the or ninth alternate? I don't know what he was, but he, possibly. Um, I think Nick Price pulled out and he got in and he won and uh, it was just a great story and it's got people's champion kind of vibe you know but yeah. John Daly back at the time yeah and um, and, and like uh, was a marketing phenomenon yeah uh, wild the, thing the the Orca driver came out that everybody wanted and he had the red and black shafts yeah um, and uh, that really went down well with people and very talented won the Open then at St Andrews uh, like dr drove it a mile but had a lovely um, touch around the greens so and his son is going to be the next big thing well they won that father and son didn't they yeah. they beat the, the Woods lads um, at the end of last year so um, John has been a bit sick uh, so I hope he's alright um, he's had a, a wild lifestyle he's had a wild lifestyle uh, lots of Diet Cokes um, so yeah like th this week's going to have so many storylines we don't even know yet we don't even know we got Marikawa Dustin Johnson like Justin Thomas, the, the, the quality of golf for Scotty Scheffler now would have been a, to win back-to-back -back major championships. It's going to be great. And uh, hopefully we'll have a, an Irish winner. Uh, Albie Littlewood was in touch to say it was a decent documentary, even though I thought it should have got the last dance treatment, 10-hour job. Which documentary is this? The Ferguson documentary on Amazon Prime. I don't know if you've oh, seen it. I haven't seen it yet, no. I remember the John Snow interview. I remember Ferguson probably thought he was going to have an easy ride and it was one of the best pieces of journalism I've seen in, in recent years. Uh, Snow took him to the cleaners. Um, but I'm looking forward to the documentary. Is it just the United era or is it also Aberdeen? And it's, it starts with uh, his playing career, which I, oh. I didn't know very much about. I hadn't, I hadn't read any of the Ferguson biographies and so maybe the stuff about falling out with his dad for ages is in that. They didn't speak and then Ferguson scores a hat-trick and uh, his dad kind of makes peace with him and he makes peace with the dad too because he kind of feels like he's ready to but there's like that fire and that um, and fighting they're fighting on the streets all the time uh, when they're kids and he's protecting the brother and um, you know it's just that you see his character being formed there and the the street fighter and the bearing grudges and the sheer bloody mindedness and the overcoming stuff um, but also like the slights along the way that drive him and I mean, that part of it's really excellent, but as Joseph Conroy pointed out, there's no mention of the Rocket Gibraltar, there's no mention of the fallout with Keane, there's no mention really of um, facilitating the takeover with the Glazers. But, like, the thing with the Glazers is it's like, you know, as owners go, they're not the Saudis, you know? Well, the thing with the Glazers, the Glazers just made bad decisions. So at the time, you David Gill and Ferguson there. So if you're just give, if you're giving them money, they're, they're going to spend the money in the right they way. They kept David Gill when Ferguson went for yeah. another five years, things probably would have been grand. So if you're giving Ed Woodward a billion and then if the wrong infrastructure's there in terms of personnel, then you're going to get into the mess you've got into. Yeah. Now, they have leveraged the club, um, you know, with hundreds of millions of debt. So they, they have, but they paid off all that debt and they've, they've invested a lot of money. Like, it's not like, it's not, you know, I, it, there's definitely, 
the, the case can be made to defend them that the that has not hampered the club spending on players. It may have hampered the club spending on the facility of Old Trafford and the match day experience, but at the same time, you know, um, while they don't have the, the Spurs stadium, uh, they are going to start investing in Old Trafford over the next few years. And the money that they've spent on players has been wasted. And if it hadn't been wasted, they'd still be one of the top teams in the world. And so therefore, yeah. it's not like... A bit like Everton. Everton, if they hadn't spent hundreds of millions on the wrong structure in terms of human capital, they wouldn't be fighting for their lives. Yeah, uh, Ferguson, I don't know if it's in a documentary, uh, he was meant to go to Canada. He was meant to leave Scotland. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then he scored that hat trick, and he felt that the world does move in mysterious ways, and there might be something else. Yeah, so that is in that, and and his relationship with the wife and the and the sons and the family, like that, the importance of the family, is writ large in this. It's like, um, you know, it's the the one thing above all, and um, so it's definitely worth watching. You definitely you do have to watch it with a knowledge that there is an alternative version to many of these stories too. Jock Steen, yeah, was his big mentor, wasn't he? It's like Ferguson managed at a World Cup, you know. One thing that sometimes people forget. Um, and uh, Rocket Gibraltar wasn't expected to win that Guinness. Was the outsider of the two. So Rocket Gibraltar was like an absolute superstar as a horse, as a as a runner. And but a, a flop as a sire. A damn squib, ultimately. Yeah, they yeah. ended up fighting about you know, nothing. what ended up being like, the, yeah. you can get him for five grand stand now. Yeah, it was, uh, it was nothing really to do with it. It was more about what you think is rightfully yours or not, and uh, Hawkwing and Rocket Gibraltar, yeah, he was, um, it, 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 was a, it was a sad, actually, it's a sad split, and obviously we saw the consequences of it with the, the fact that the Glazers ended up taking over United, you know. All right, anything else going on? Uh, well, obviously the boxers, I'm sure you would mentioned them, um, Amy Broadhurst and uh, Lisa were work fighting. It's $100,000 if they win today, their bouts. They've already pocketed about $50,000, so Everton, as you say, played, taking on Crystal Palace tonight. Uh, Burnley only need the point against Aston Villa to move out of the drop zone. Chelsea, Leicester, Sean Grover's ECD. Uh, four of the five men being questioned about alleged max fix match fixing in the League of Ireland have been released by Gardaí. Among ten men uh, arrested yesterday as part of Operation Brookweed. So one re man remains in Gardaí custody this morning. Uh, Dublin meet Kildare, as you know, JR two tenth eight points. Last night, Tipperary Cork in the Munster minor semi final tonight, racing at Tipperary as well. But it's all about one o'clock tea time. I think Sky are starting at one o'clock today. So um, it's going to be, uh, I think breaks are going to be needed between the couch and the bed. Get into your jocks, get on the, t <laughs> on the couch, get the uh, delivery fired up. Yeah, base pizza. Don't move. Base pizza. Yeah, you've got, well, you've got that, that uh, in terms of television viewing, that glorious um, Spieth, Tiger, Rory at two o'clock today. Oh, yeah, yeah, that'll be brilliant. Nice, nice and early. Yeah. Uh, because there'd be a lot of macho around that. There'd be a lot of, even a, a, within that three ball, there'd be people wanting to be the top dog. Mm. Um, th it's funny how they have records of how well you play with people as well. And um, Tiger's record with speed, not great. Right. But um, yeah, uh, all that, all those, all those kind of meaningless statistics that they pump out in American sports, I love. I could <sighs> hook that shit to my veins. John, good stuff. Sorry, Thanks, William. Take care. It's eight fifty-four this morning. You're watching OTBAM. We're live every morning on YouTube. We're live every morning on the OTB Sports app. You can listen to us as a radio show. Just tell your smart speaker to play OTB Sports Radio, and away you go. And we're live each morning with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Now, I'm delighted to welcome Gavin Kilkenny to the show. Gavin, good morning. How are you getting on? Hi, lads. How's things? You yeah, right? good. Yeah, very good. Listen, before we get into um, the season you've had and uh, and what you hope is going to come next season, will you just tell us a bit about yourself? Whereabouts in Dublin are you from? Uh, I'm from Bournemouth. Uh, Bournemouth, sorry. I'm from Bournemouth. <laughs> um, very similar. Um, so, yeah, I grew up in Bournemouth. It's just a, obviously a suburb in Dublin. Um, so I grew up there and lived there my whole life. Um, played for St. Kevin's Boys from the age of seven, six, seven onwards. Um, and then obviously played there till I was 16, played a bit of Gaelic football as well with um, Whitehall, Colin Kill, the local team. So mixed them both until I was about 13, not probably 13, 14. Yeah. And then obviously chose the football and moved over to Bournemouth when I was 16. So yeah, that's it really. Football and hurling with Colin Kills or, or just football? Yeah, a bit of hurling as well. I was never, never great at the hurling, which is funny really because uh, the family, obviously my mum and nanny were actually big into the Camogie, but they tried to get me into the hurling, but uh, I tried, but I, I don't know, I was probably a bit of a wimp at the time. <laughs> you, you better explain your genes properly there. Um, so your granny yeah. was actually a superstar camogie player, was she? Yeah, I probably underplayed her there. I would have gone on for that later. But um, yeah, she was She was an All-Ireland winner for Dublin. Um, 
she was like inducted into the Hall of Fame for Camogie and stuff. So, uh, yeah, she was obviously brilliant. And then my mom was similar. She won a few All Irelands with Dublin as well. So, what was your granny's uh, name? I see we're seeing a thing from the Herald there. Uh, Carmel a dub of the rare old times. So, did she win three or four All Irelands? Yeah, Carmel Cooper. Yeah, she won three or four. Yeah, she played in goal for Dublin. Um, so yeah, she was she was mad into the Camogie. I think she managed then Dublin a bit after that. So, um, yeah, she she was huge. Obviously, in my huge influence obviously in my career when I was growing up like more so from it just kind of getting me into sport and stuff along with obviously a few others um, and yeah she probably laid the foundations obviously like I said with a few other people to get me into the, the sport and so yeah we have all them to thank Did she give you a good sense of how dominant that team was like for people who don't realise between 1948 and 1966 yeah. there was only one Camogie All-Ireland winner that wasn't Dublin that was it's it's one of the most dominant runs in really? Irish sports history, and a lot of people just aren't aware of it. No, she well, in fairness to her, she didn't brag because I didn't I didn't know that now. But obviously, I knew how good she was, but she wouldn't have been the type to, to brag. Obviously, and um, she was quite humble. But you could tell by the way she she carried herself. Obviously, she was like a very confident woman, and she knew exactly like going forward. Me, she was obviously quite strong in what I should do, and she would never. She'd always tell you to be brave and fearless, and you could obviously probably tell that she came from something good herself in the sense of she's come from a good story with Dublin like you said so yeah you can probably pick her up pick it up off her without her probably bragging about it too much so quite yeah. com- quite competitive I suspect that uh, that Dublin team who, yeah who beat very com- it's a very competitive family to be fair and it probably stems from her a little bit even little things we're on holidays now and there's there's killings all of our little things table tennis <laughs> and everything uh, they're doing a bit of go kart and everyone's you know competitive to win and that probably all stems there from from that sort of background so yeah so hang on, you're a footballer on fam- on a family holiday with like um, multi generations. You're not in I and Appa with a bunch of other footballers. No, no, I'm not actually. I'm on a family holiday. We're back. Um, it's funny. We're back in a spot that we used to go at. Um, my nanny, obviously, she passed away now a few years ago. But we're back in Cambrils. We're going to Barcelona now tomorrow. Um, for the F1 to watch the F1. So we're all here. Um, obviously, then I'll be back on the weekend. I'm obviously training over here because we have the internationals next week. So. It's not exactly a holiday, but it's it's a it's a sunny it's a sunnier place. So, yeah. How is the body after a season? What what what's it like? What, are you are you in perfect yeah. form? Like what's it like? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. I, I had t- uh, about a week off after. I obviously didn't play many games towards the end of the season, but I played the last game um, against Millwall. So I probably wasn't as tired as like some other players might have been that played played the rest of the games towards the end. But obviously the training is still very intense, and there was always the kind of the thought at the back of my head that I might play the last game so I was probably working very hard so it, it does take its toll even if you're not playing every game um, but yeah I feel, I feel fine I just need to now obviously I trained yesterday I'm going to go training after this and just get back into it and then hopefully go into next weekend flying ready for the 21s qualifiers which are obviously huge games What What's your game Gavin? How do you describe yourself? Uh, how do I describe myself? Uh, probably I just in midfield I want to obviously dominate the games with the ball um, so I'd probably say I'm, like me technical qualities are probably my strong points I think a lot of coaches that manage will probably agree with that um, so passing and whatever receiving and that's obviously what I like to do I like to dictate games but probably in the last year it's been one of my biggest things was to learn that you can't always dictate games with the ball and I think that the championship has obviously taught me that, that sometimes it's not as pretty as you like you put, used to playing 23s games and stuff for Bournemouth which is brilliant but that's where you kind of you have the ball the whole game so it's, it's easy for me then um, it's, it's more so now about you know getting involved in the, the hustle and the bustle sort of with the midfield and I think I've learned that and that's obviously a key element to the game at all levels so that was really important to be fair Am I right in saying that it would have been more kind of away from central midfield you would have played maybe under Stephen Kenny and and for Jim Crawford for the 21s on the right and maybe even a little bit on the left and then for Bournemouth at the yeah, start of this no, season fine, yeah. you, were, you were more central for, for the club at the start of this season yeah and no, I used to play for Kevin's growing up when I was younger I used to play as a, as a winger now they used to sometimes move me in as a, a centre midfielder or a 10 but it was always sort of as a winger what, what the thinking was I don't know was maybe I was a bit smaller maybe I didn't you know trust me in the middle a bit but um as I grew older, I think Eddie Hale moved me into the middle when I was about 19. I played a couple of preseason friendlies and he said to me, like Bournemouth played a 4-4-2 and there wasn't really a position that wide for me in the sense of like it would be tough to kind of use my qualities at wide. And then as a 10, it was a bit more, you know, 
like a bit more physical. There was a lot of pressing involved, which is fine, but he kind of thought it'd be best to move me into a two in midfield. And then it went from there. Now, with Ireland, they probably didn't kick in until, like you said, this summer. So about two years later, I was playing out wide for, for Stephen first, right midfield and, and in GM, obviously. And just to be fair to them, I, I just don't think they see me in centre midfield because I was playing a lot of 23s games for Bournemouth there. But it was tough for them to, to see. You know, GM and me laugh because. I obviously played sentiment for him now, but he played as a right midfielder. And even the last game against Sweden, uh, I crossed in the ball and Ross scored, but it was actually quite similar to where I was. It used to be, I ended up out wide, but yeah, we laugh about how he used to play me as a right midfielder, but now, obviously, look at me now, you probably wouldn't think that, but that was all probably part of my development and there's probably elements of my game now that you can see maybe that I used to be a winger, so it's probably stood to me a little bit as well. We get in, get stuck a little bit in the habit of talking about numbers uh, it's kind of a shorthand for us about where a player plays on the pitch it, it sounds yeah. like um, it sounds like you're kind of a, an 8 with a, a bit of 10 is that right? No I, I wouldn't say that no not, not anymore I'd probably be a bit a bit deeper than that now uh, you can take the 10 out but you can leave the 8 maybe <laughs> I still see myself playing as a bit of an 8 but with, with Bournemouth I've played a lot of the season and as a four, they call it. It's like a hold midfielder, obviously. And then I've moved up into the eight at times, but no, I haven't played a ten, unfortunately. Um, the days have passed a little bit. They might come back at some stage, but no, I haven't played as a ten, so I'd be lying about that. But I don't mind playing deeper. It probably suits my qualities a little bit. So, 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 so what was the situation in the, in the second half of the season, Gavin? Obviously, you're training way with the squad. You played a lot more in the the first half of the season. And um, what what was the story of the second half of the season for you? Um, it was just probably a circumstance thing. We, we signed, obviously, a, a lot of players in January. He signed The manager signed about, I don't know, exactly six, six or seven players, maybe more. Um, and obviously, it was just at a stage where it was getting a bit, you know, it was getting a bit tough for us in terms of games. We were, I think, we went on a little bit of a bad run. And I played the last game. The last game I played was Middlesbrough in December the 18th. I don't know, right? We lost the game, though, and then I came back. I played a couple of cup games, and then we signed a lot of players. So, they naturally had a bit more Premier League experience and stuff, which obviously is not an excuse, but I think that probably just went against me a little bit. And they're obviously top players, so they all they all got a bit they got in and it just probably then led to it. there's so many players that I got left out of squads and stuff, along with a few big names. Like it wasn't just myself, there was there was big players that were being left out of squads, which showed probably the strength of the squad. And then um from there it was just trying to keep my head and just go from there and then looking at your manager. I've been training well the last couple of months and he gave me a chance in the last game. Obviously, probably after playing at the start, he might have felt that I deserved it, which was nice. So it was nice to get the last game. So, but, um, yeah, obviously, it was just probably a bit of circumstance, a bit of experience, but obviously, it's not an excuse. But um, going forward, then I'd like to probably try to get to a stage where they, I can't be, they're not excuses, you know what I mean, where I can just be seen as one of the rest, sort of. Uh- when that happens, do you have long-term conversations or is it like immediate short-term, what do I need to do this week or what do I need to do over the next couple of months when you're talking to the coach and staff? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Look, it's just, he was really good at me, to be fair. There was never a stage where he shoved me out or like I was always very much involved and in he said that to me, like you're still a major part of the squad. Like it was never a case of, look, you're not playing. Like, but look, it was always, you know, just keep working hard and like this is maybe a sort of a longer-term picture with yourself. So I knew it wasn't the end of the world. As much as I wanted to play, I knew it was at the business end of the season and we're going for a Premier League and maybe experience might have been the way forward at that time. So it was just a case of believing in what the manager was saying and, you know, on to next season now we're in the Premier League, obviously. So obviously it's every kid's dream to play there and that's no different to me. So I'd love to play in the Premier League next season. Whether that happens, I don't know, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, the manager's been brilliant. So as much as he didn't play in the last few games, but I can't really fault him because he gave me a chance at the start of the season when... A lot of managers probably wouldn't, and obviously that paid off for myself. So, yeah. Did you feel you were still developing during that period when you were not in the squad? Did you feel like the training was still enough for you to continue to grow as a player in that squad? Yeah, yeah. The training's unbelievable, to be honest. The coaching staff at one time, they, obviously Scott Parker and, and Matt Wells, they came from Fulham, and, but they've obviously came through the ranks and they're obviously quite new. Um, but the coaching is something now I haven't seen much because I'm only young but the coaching probably something I've never seen and Eddie Howe was obviously brilliant in his own way but the, the level of detail and stuff from the two is is unbelievable to be honest so even just training and even though the training is not that intense tactically I'm just learning stuff that I probably wouldn't see before and obviously there's a lot of stuff that are based off the top teams which is obviously the way to do it I think because 
if you, you're gonna learn you gotta learn from the best so i think i was still developing yeah and then obviously i went away with ireland in march which broke it up a little bit we played sweden that was a good game so that obviously helped um keep me fit so yeah what sort of bits are you learning like the the, the thing you mentioned there about new things that you possibly hadn't seen before yeah. what, what sort of bits are they yeah, it's just tactically it's it's probably like stuff i've never seen it's it's a lot of stuff maybe based off guardiola and stuff and then the manager obviously park has played in, in the middle and he's obviously gave me a lot of tips on how to play and one of his big things would have been with me like look it's, you have to do the dirty side of the game and I know, I know i have to do the dirty side of the game but it's probably nailing that down and when you hear from somebody like him who's who's done it for years in the premier league i think it, it really hits home a little bit more um, and then just it's a little like finer finer details about positioning and just doing the extra couple of yards and then it'll save you in the long not in the long run but it'll save you you know getting basically smashed in the middle if you make a few extra yards to get the ball it will save some big me head from maybe smashing in the middle and that that probably was a big thing for me as well because obviously being maybe smaller stature i have to be clever in certain areas and you know avoid certain battles maybe and that was probably key as well and then just like second balls and stuff and i've played obviously really good midfielders which has been good and they've helped me but just learning to sort of deal with second balls and you know how to be clever and pick them up maybe in areas where you don't get yourself into as much trouble so yeah and are you impatient at the moment or do you feel like it's okay for now that there'll be a time down the line where not playing football for your career is going to be something that you have to be totally impatient about maybe when you're 26, 27 you're going to play no. you have to play every week but at the moment are you okay or are you getting impatient yeah. what, what's that like? Uh, impatient is probably probably not impatient but I know what you mean I probably know going into next season I think the last few months was fine because um, it was only a few months but now I know that going into next season obviously I'll go into pre-season with Bournemouth with every intention to play there in the Premier League but obviously I know in my own head that I need to play football next season I know I'm 22 but you can, you can say I'm only 22 but I'm still you know I'm not a young player anymore so to speak I'm not up and coming so I need to obviously play games I've shown this year that I can play at that level when I've played and obviously if I'd love to get a run of games I think like a run of 10 15 games in a row maybe because I think then that could really show everyone so I'd, I'd like to play yeah uh, next season I think I probably need to play where where that is I don't know hopefully more with but obviously I'm open to that and yeah there's no rush obviously like you say but I think next season I want to play football every week yeah and if if like that hasn't happened for Bournemouth in the Premier League by Christmas would you be open to a low move for the second half of the season is that part of your development is that even something you would have a conversation with the management about yeah well yeah no definitely yeah, it's to be fair like I was meant to there was a lot of talks about going alone in January, so it wasn't something that, like, the, like wasn't talked talked about already. There was when the manager signed all the players in January. He said to me, "Look, we can potentially look into going alone." But then obviously things changed and certain things happened. So he in the end he told me that he'd, he'd like me to stay. So um, I don't know this summer it might be different, but it, it might be similar in the sense that we're up in the Premier League now. We can probably sign a lot of players. Um, that doesn't mean he won't look for me because obviously he's, he showed previously that he's. He has a lot of belief in me, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, definitely, if I'm not playing either in the summer or in the in January, like you said, I'll definitely look for a loan, um, or yeah, whatever that may be, to, to try and get some football because I think that's really important for me to and play football. You've got a long term contract, I think, to 2025, so there's there's security there. If you were to go out for a year on loan, you'd know that you'll get the opportunity to go back and go back as a better player with more experience. Yeah, no, definitely. The club have shown a lot of faith in me, and they've shown that. There's that longer term pathway, not pathway, picture sort of. There's the longer term plan that they know that it might not be last year. Obviously, I showed last year I can play, but maybe now it's about going and getting games and then coming back. And like you said, then if we're seeing the Premier League, great, and that could be my, my way in because obviously that's the the end goal is to play, play in the Premier League. It's not to, like you want to play in the Championship, but you don't grow up as a kid and say, without being, you know, sounding wrong, you don't want to grow nobody wants to grow up and play in the Championship their whole career. You know, at the end of the day, you want to play in the Premier League, so that's no different to me. So, um, hopefully, I'll do that. How that is, I don't know yet, but yeah, we'll see. Um, that win against Sweden for the under twenty ones was was huge. Um, it was yeah. a, a big performance, a big result, and it kind of it makes the rest of the campaign really interesting as well. What's your level of excitement about like there? And, and you know, you you just talked about having big dreams. Like the team needs to dream big as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a huge win to be honest, it's, especially off the back of beating them at home as well. Just and that was obviously an unbelievable fashion with the, the late winner. So 
we went to Sweden and we knew the circumstances. So you could say it was a high pressure game. It was basically it was win or else it's over, really. So and we we all knew there was a June camp either way. And like a lot of lads would tell you, like we absolutely love coming into the camp. So we didn't want to come into June, especially in the middle of the summer. You know, what I mean, it's a bit of an awkward time for everyone, and you don't want to come in and there's nothing to play for. You know, that's the last thing you want. So we were just delighted that we we won the game and gave ourselves something to play for going into it in June. And obviously, it was a brilliant performance, probably in a different sort of way to to usual. We had to set up a lot defensively. Uh, Sweden are obviously a top side and they played us at home and Jim obviously set us up really well that day obviously I probably think he would have liked to be more front foot on attacking but just the circumstance of the day we obviously had to drop back and it was a brilliant performance defensively um, so that, that was it was amazing to be honest with you we loved it even though it's not probably something that I enjoyed too much it was it was great to actually grind that win um, and yeah so the, the games in two weeks obviously have a lot of meaning now so uh, three huge games I'm hard in saying Jim Crawford left you out of his first couple of squads. Yeah, but it would yeah it would have been the campaign before this. But it was like when when Stephen left to go to seniors, and then Jim came in and he let, he left me out of a couple of squads. Yeah, but uh, we've made up now. But no, I'm only joking. Jim's great. Um, <laughs> he's I, I love Jim to be honest. I haven't got a lot of bad words to say about him. I think a lot of lads would agree with that. He's one of their managers that he probably run through a brick wall for a little bit because he's very good man managing you know I mean? he makes you feel <laughs> makes you feel a million dollars sometimes but yeah he did leave me out in fairness I'm not letting that go now but yeah, yeah. Like, um, it was just I don't know it was just a matter of circumstance at the time a little bit I was there was a, good, a lot of good players at that age to be fair and he was still playing the out wide and it, it wasn't my best position and um, he seen me as a wide player and I, I probably didn't see the same myself it was probably burnt on the same page a little bit as well and he thought it was best to leave me out so it was never like no personal we, he spoke to me he never just kind of left me out and didn't say anything he always rang me in fairness to let me know and we've, we've always been on good terms and then obviously this campaign I've came in I've, he's made me an integral part from the start so yeah he's been brilliant for me to be honest I, I presume when, when you're the manager of an under-21 team as well you're never quite sure how a player is going to react to that sort of situation and I presume yeah. he's, he's impressed by your positive reaction to it and, and I wonder from your own perspective as well are you kind of looking at that Ireland experience and thinking to yourself listen I've, I've been through this before I can, I can absolutely take this into my club form and react really yeah. well to, to you know, not being in the squad here and there throughout the season Yeah I think that's crucial any, any sport but it's, it's just so important to how you react because it's easy to just you know, it's easy to blame others, I think, as well. You know, you're not playing, it's easy to blame the manager, and sometimes it probably is the manager. Um, but you know, you see a lot of things happen where people want to blame other people, and I think it's probably the easy way to do it. I think it's important that you just kind of look look in the mirror first and see why. Obviously, sometimes it's young players and you get maybe the wrong end of the stick, and that's tough at club level, obviously, it's international, it's different, but. I think it's important that you look at yourself first and that's what I've tried to do and just look at myself and what can I do to improve and obviously just have belief and then be patient as well like you said because sometimes it's just a matter of time and then luckily with the 21s it's probably happened for me this year it hasn't happened previously so hopefully with club it's, it's similar obviously the difference so sort of setting but yeah it's, it's just been about being patient We well, wish you the very best of luck for the upcoming qualifiers Gavin and for next season as well wherever Thank that you. is thanks a million for, sure. for uh, joining us enjoy the holidays cheers Thanks, lads. Cheers. See you later. That's uh, Gavin Kilkenny there giving us some thoughts on um, the season that he's had. Those those games, by the way, there's already 3,000 tickets sold for the games in Tallaght. It's the bank holiday weekend, Friday, June 3rd, and uh, Monday, June 6th. The Monday kickoff is a 5 o'clock kickoff, so if you were thinking of bringing the kids, um, that might be one to go for. OTBM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Our first roadshow in nearly three years. We're almost there. The football pod have just added a Mayo legend to the lineup for Castle Bar on the 2nd of June. They will reveal who on Monday morning after the draw. Paddy and James will be at the Royal Theatre up against a man that they had several battles with on big days at Croke Park. Sworn to secrecy, as I said, for now. A brilliant night of football chat. Plenty of focus on Mayo. It's the football pod of Paddy, James and Tommy in Castle Bar. They will talk about other things too. On that. Maybe they won't. I mean, it'll just be three hours of... And, and why do you think you score on goals in the finals? <laughs> and why do you think you miss freeze? at the last minute when you don't misfreeze the rest of the year what is it is it a curse do you think it's a curse uh, there won't be any mention of the curse I promise on Thursday June 2nd tickets are 20 euros plus booking fees go to otbsports.com forward slash events for more here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today uh, Lance Armstrong at 1 o'clock Stuart Lancaster at 3 a retro panel called Capturing Great Stories at 4 could be anything Barry Ryan at 6 and uh, the show is live tonight from 7 you can follow us across all our social platforms 
be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, which means anytime we go live, we'll ping you a message. And you can also get the OTB Sports app. And we're back with Alan Quinlan, where he's picking his combined Munster Leinster 15 after these. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The greatest league in the world is back. Every Friday night after the League of Ireland Games, a place for you to come. To give your opinion to Vane, there's a little button down in the left-hand corner where you can say that you want to talk. And Johnny, you're just going to have I, to mute yourself because you're ruining it for everybody. I can't. I'm still ruining it, am I? You are, yeah, yes. We're yes. going to talk about Waterford FC now. Uh, let's okay. see the real first division now. For immediate reaction from around the grounds, catch League of Ireland late night, Friday nights at 10 on Twitter Spaces. Follow at Off The Ball. This is Sport Ireland Campus. And here is where it all starts. From the little ones learning, to the high performance athletes leading. Here we go to play, to practice, to progress. Here is where communities and the nation come together to compete, to win and to belong. Here we go to the next level, then on to the world stage. This is Sport Ireland Campus and here we go. Visit sportirelandcampus.ie to be a part of it. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. So Leinster play Munster at the Aviva this weekend. It might not be the full Leinster team. In fact, we're almost certain it won't be. And there's a few injuries for Munster as well. But we did decide that this was an opportunity for us to compare and contrast the relative fortunes of the teams at the moment by picking a combined 15. We know people love combined teams. It's one of their favourite things about sport, isn't it? I wonder who's going to have more players in this team. It could be 50-50, Owen. Yeah. Yeah, hard to tell. Especially in the 15-man team. Alan Quinlan, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Good. How many Leinster players in your combined 15 at the moment? Oh, Jesus. Um, about 12 or 13, I'd say. And that's 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 not a big surprise to anyone, really. Um, I'm kind of basing it off selection for the Six Nations, really. And... Um, Lots of, uh, well, I suppose lots of Munster people would be disappointed with the representation and the amount of Munster players that would would have been on that Irish team. And um, But look, it's probably fair enough. Um, and they proved themselves in November and in, and, and in the Six Nations. So the only ones that are probably getting in are Ty Byrne. Um, Ty Byrne and Andrew Conway were the ones for the Six Nations. I think if Conway is fit, he's... Um, He's probably getting into the team. Um, Keith Earls maybe as well, if he plays enough of games. Um, the, the obvious candidates are Peter O'Mahony. I think the way he's played um, in the last couple of months and the season he's had this year, he's been outstanding. Um, Connor Murray is not shifting Van der Fleer, but he's on the bench. you know. So you're kind of basing it off <coughs> the Six Nations. But um, yeah, there's 12, 13 Leinster players in there. I left I left Tigburn out of mine because he's not fit at the moment. So I'm kind of post European Cup quarter final weekend. Okay, okay. And so uh, front row who are, all Leinster, right? Uh I to troll the Munster fans I put Jenkins in second row. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> that was that yeah. was just so four Leinster so far. That's just being it. Exactly. Well, I don't know who the second row partner for James Ryan is after, at this stage, right? Because Burns not fit, but Burns in the team if he's fit. Nailed on, 100%. Guaranteed. He's definitely in the combined team. Of course, ex Leinster too. But um, who would your second row be now, this week, if you had to pick a team? Um, it's probably Ross Maloney, the way he's played against Toulouse and, and Leicester. Um, I think Finneen Witcherly was was really good and Thomas Dehearn when he came off the bench and, and obviously he has huge potential but if you're picking a team for um, if it was a big game this week for a combined team uh, it would probably be Ross Maloney really and uh, it's Can we just get a moment to think about Ross Maloney? reality. What, what, how, how has his game evolved to the point where like the skill set in the game against Toulouse the weekend there was like two the exact same pass where it's no look and it's straight to the breadbasket of whoever it's supposed to go to and it's clear that they've practiced this a gazillion times but it was like wow that's pretty good they're like basketball skills for a, a, a big man um, his evolution as a player I think is one of the testament biggest testimonies to the coaching ticket at Leinster and also his hard work and him as an individual. So he's got to get a lot of credit for that. But he's on the fringes of Ireland selection at the moment, isn't he? 
Yeah, he is. I think he's um, his game has improved so much, I think, and uh, always very talented and skillful would have sh- shown that in his schools rugby and, and representation uh, representing underage teams in Leinster. Um, I just think he was kind of probably pigeonholed as being not the biggest second row and most physical second row in the world for a number of years. And, the, and, I, and look, I'm guilty of it too, picking this kind of athletic uh, football line-out winner and then a bit of a kind of a brute and a physical type second row. Um, but the game has evolved a lot as well, that it's all about pace and tempo now. And I think he's got bigger in himself. He's obviously grown. He's he's not a young player. He's 27. And some players are a little bit later developing as well. Um, I'm not saying that he wasn't developed at 21, 22, 23, but... I think he's learned a lot. He's probably, he looks more confident. And I think if you, you know, he hasn't been selected in the big games over the years. Um, up until now, um, he's always been seen as a very valuable asset to the Leinster squad and played lo- loads of league games. But um, you're talking about the skill set, Ger, and that's just repetition and, and it's footballing ability. And I'm sure he, ha- he had that footballing ability in him, but just... Um, you know, repetitive work around that area and uh, trying to build his confidence as well. He's always been a brilliant line-out player and uh, really intelligent in running a line-out, which is a great asset to any team. So um, if Leinster had a Brad Thorne or, um, you know, some type of player like that, or even Jenkins coming in, if Jenkins was there to start the year, would they have selected Ross Maloney? because of the perception around that physicality? So yeah, I, I don't know. In some ways, he's been selected because... They've been kind of forced into that selection, really. Uh, Ryan Baird has been injured as well. so And he's actually shown people, wow, this guy actually can deliver and play at this, uh, this level. Um, he's not the biggest second round in the world. Um, and that that sounds like a criticism. It's not. I think he's he's actually, he's probably been pigeonholed in that bracket for a number of years. That he's not this big, strong brute. Um, but I think he's grown, he's developed, he's got stronger. And looking at the work rate around the field and the tackles and obviously his skill set. So I think he, he deserves a massive credit and I think he should go to uh, to New Zealand now because he's shown people what he can do at the top level and he can handle that, that physicality. Uh, it wasn't just the skills on Saturday. He was his tackle reload, his work rate, his fitness levels and... You know, I think he, he deserves massive credit for what he's done. Is it fair to say that maybe there, there was like a huge expectation, not huge expectation, but a certain degree of expectation on him at the very start? Like he plays really well in a game against uh, Bath in, in 2016. Leo Cullen is quite open in terms of managing his rise to the top. He talks about like focusing quite a lot on the gym work that maybe he just needed a couple of years, uh, not away from the limelight, but like I guess allowing Devin Toner and James Ryan to be kind of your, your two starting locks and for kind of this guy to be developing away in the background and maybe Leinster knew that this was going to happen a lot more than, than we would. Yeah, I, there's certain players that they become excellent provincial players and you think they're just sitting below on that level of being a top-class international and getting to that level. And sometimes unfairly we kind of label them at that level and um, they don't get the opportunity they, they you really rely on them and you know that they're very good players and you don't you love playing with them but they're just kind of in everyone's head they're just that level below and sometimes it is perception and it's selection as well if you're continuously getting called up into international level you do get a kind of a uh, a status within the group that you're an international and it can be very unfair at times and there's loads of guys I would have played with that they would have been in that position that oh god they're brilliant players they're unbelievable professionals but they're not international they're not getting called up to internationals because they're just that level below yeah. that top level so you can get kind of labelled and left in that group but I think what I admire about what he's done is he's continuously kind of turned up for Leinster even in those league games away to the Dragons or Edinburgh um, you know, on the Friday nights or the Sundays through the internationals the last number of years he continuously turns up and plays really well so I think his level of performance he's just taken it another level and he has got stronger and will, so will, some guys again can he keep Jenkins out know, of the team next season? Um, well the way he's playing at the moment um, if he continues in that level and I think 
his perception will have changed. So he'll have a different swagger about him if he finishes the season strong and, and you know they win a European Cup and the URC and he goes to New Zealand. Well, then it's a totally different perception that everybody has of him going forward. Um, so you don't know. like okay. uh, We don't know where Jenkins is either, to be honest. He hasn't played that really well for Munster. He's shown glimpses. He's a big, big man. I'm sure they'll try and improve him in certain areas, particularly in the for a big fella in the physical stakes. Um, he probably needs to get to a different level and use his strength and, and size. But okay. Ross Maloney, I think, has been brilliant and he deserves credit. Okay, the back row, um, Caelan Doris, six, Josh van der Fleer, seven, Jack Conan, eight, is the Leinster back row. Who from Munster gets in that at the moment? Well, Peter Oman, is injured for this weekend, but I just think it, like in November, I'd be going for Doris Cohn and Van der Fleer. Um, three exceptional players, um, unbelievable balance to that back row. But I just think the way Mahoney has played in the last few months against far more pressure than the Leinster back row would have been under. Um, I think he has to get in there somewhere. Um, Six. Maybe at six and Jack Conan loses out and goes to the bench like he did for some of the, the latter part of the Six Nations, which is unfair because I, I've i always stated I'm a Jack Conan fan and I think he's a great footballer and it's been incredible to see him get the best out of himself in the last couple of years. Uh, after maybe a Ross Maloney type number of years, if you like, um, he's taken that step up and been brilliant and went in the line. So it's very unfair. Very little separating um, them. But I think, like, it isn't Munster bias. I think even the Leinster fans would admit O'Mahony has been exceptional. You know, the Exeter games, the turnovers against Toulouse, um, against un- so, under so much pressure. Um, I think he's been phenomenal and he's played really well for Ireland as well. So he's had a really, really consistent year, Peter O'Mahony. So he's probably the only one that in that back row that can challenge that situation. Hopefully, Kendall and John Hodnett and these guys, Gavin Coombs, can can put a bit more pressure and, and push themselves into Irish recognition next year. Yeah, and with the Mary with the Mary midweek yeah. games, I'd, you'd hope they all go. Like and Jack O'Donoghue. And Jack, o, Jack O'Donoghue has been exceptional as well. So, but you know, top class internationals. Um, I, I just look at the players I played. I was trying to get into an Irish team in 2009, the Grand Slam. Heaslip, Leamy, Wallace, Ferris. Phenomenal not players, bad. and just sometimes they're just they're just at a level. You think of Sean O'Brien, um, and the power of these guys. You know, this Leinster back row are, are kind of up up above, up at that level. They're that good. Yeah, they're that powerful. They're that balanced. So sometimes there's good players underneath are just unfortunately they're going to be a bit unlucky. And if they wait for opportunities, whether through an injury or drop in form. Um, but I just think O'Mahony has been brilliant this year. I don't know if you di- agree or disagree with me. I, I think because I have to be, you know, I want to be careful. I think um, the last two O'Mahony's performances, right? That, that yeah, like, completely yeah, changes the perception. Exception. Yeah, it does. And I, th- but I think Owen, he's been very consistent this year in the games he's played as well. And it's not just coming up with an odd steal or in the lineout or at the breakdown. I think he's tackling, he's carrying. Everything has been on um, a different level for Peter O'Mahony. Okay, so Amani's the first first um, player in the in the combined fifteen. After that, then the nine and ten, I think there's no real they room. They picked themselves, yeah. Yeah, they so it's themselves. Gibson Park and Sexton, and then on the wing, like James Lowe is in the team. But after that, is it does Zebo get in or does Earls get in? Earls gets in. Jimmy O'Brien ahead of Jimmy. It's it's very difficult, and again, Jimmy O'Brien is on. <laughs> um, He's one of those players. He's just been brilliant for Leinster this year, hasn't he? You know, he was one of the nominees for the European Player of the Year after February. You know, I think he got four tries against Bath, didn't he? Um, his, his performance is exceptional. Work rate, tackle, kick chase, um, defensively rock solid. So um, he'd probably be arguing the same point about, um, you know, getting his opportunity to get up to international level and he's someone who could go to New Zealand as well and probably deserves to go. Um, we need to bring 80 suppose, players to New Zealand. That's what we need to do. <laughs> well, I tell you, though, you know, like if you look at Conway in the Six Nations, he was brilliant. And I think Ireland kind of sparked off his season 
Um, he wasn't that good for Munster pre-Christmas. Um, even even November internationals, um, he was very very good. He was brilliant. He just looked a different player when he played for Ireland. Um, obviously, he's had a few injuries and and been very unlucky. We haven't seen him play in a while, and um, I think a fit Andrew Conway, the way he was playing for Ireland, um, challenges. Um, Keith Earls again, he's had a a, a stop start season with injury, but um, just his quality, it's hard to ignore that. So. You know, James Lowe is on one wing for definite, and then you have a big debate about who you pick in the other wing if they're fit and healthy. Conway's not, hasn't played matches at the moment, so that maybe rules him out if you're picking the team, as you say, Ger, for this week. Um, very hard to leave Jimmy O'Brien out. I think Keith Earls is such a player, such a wonderful uh, okay. attitude to the game. But so who are you picking? I don't know. It's your team. Well, just to get another monster man in, I'll pick Earlsey and Jimmy O'Brien um, won't be happy, but uh, just to get another monster player in. Hugo Keenan's fullback and no real need to talk about that, is there? No. Okay. No debate whatsoever. The only other place that I had somebody in, I had Dialende and Henshaw. But like... Well, it. I, there's one thing, and I was thinking about this as well, um, you just can't leave Dialende out, even though Henshaw and... and and Gary Ringrose, exceptional players, exceptional combination. Maybe people will disagree, but I just think he's. So you who's, can imagine who, if the D- was playing. You can imagine if D- was playing in the Leinster team, Ger, yeah. what, what he would do. He'd be pretty phenomenal, good. <laughs> getting that quite a ball. He's been on the back foot a lot, and he still does unbelievably special things. He's so strong. His hands are so good. Um, who are you leaving out? You're leaving out Robbie Henshaw or Gary Ringrose. Well. For any of the guys left out, they're, they're definitely coming off the bench very, very quickly. So there should be two. Uh, they're in the 23, shall we say. So there shouldn't be two. And there's another test the week after, so they might get a start there. Um, I don't know. Well, I think Dialinde is the first centre, isn't he? So um, Robbie Henshaw can play 13. So um, maybe you're playing you're playing the spring box and are, are you playing... England and you're looking for physicality and you play the two of them together um, you want that bit the subtle skills and the bit of balance in the outside centre and more pace probably you go with ring rows so you've gone for who Henshaw. are you picking? I picked Henshaw like, but it's a yeah probably Henshaw probably Henshaw but like, has, has, has Diolande already signed for the, the, his next club or can Leinster come in with the last gas of effort take Jenkins <laughs> and Dialende and make your dream a reality you never know he might he might be going there it's not my dream Jesus to see Damien Dialende play for Leinster I didn't want him to go in the first place for Munster because I do think he um, I think there'll be better things happening in the Munster next year they'll be uh, they'll be better hopefully you're, they have to be and you're you're a judge you're the Irish judge for the European player of the year Quinny um do you tell us in advance who the who you're voting for, or is that like only well, after? We, we 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 genuinely haven't picked it yet, right. um, uh, Ger, because um, we decide that we kind of end up having um, we have a meeting the 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 morning of the of the the final in Marseille. So we have a breakfast and we nice. have a conversation. We have a conversation about basically a little, a little about croissant the before. Conversation with yeah. Um, we have a conversation really, really about the five players and the, their merits, um, and it's not, um, it's not decided till after the game. Right. Okay. Well, let, that makes sense. Let's, let's, let, yeah, of course, because it's, you have to be fair. And really, the reality here is there was 15 players picked in in um, in February um, on a short list of of t- moving forward into the kind of knockout stages. Um, and realistically, you look back on the EPCR player of the years, they come from the probably the winning team or possibly they have to come from the finalists. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Unless somebody has this crazy pool stages that they score tries in every game, get loads of man of the matches and do the same and right up to semifinals or something like that. But historically, they've come from from the, the, the winning team or maybe the losing side. So James Lowe has come out of no, not come out of nowhere, but he wasn't in that original 15. I'll tell you who the original 15 were. Gregory Aldred, Alex Dombrandt, Caelan Doris, uh, Dupont, Fiku, George Ford, Michael Lowry, Jimmy O'Brien, Jack O'Donoghue, two players we spoke about there, Damien Penno, 
semi Rand Randra for Bristol, Sam Simmons, Marcus Smith, Josh van der Fleer, and Cameron Walkey. James Lowe wasn't in that group. Um, and you have this wriggle room to add a player or two if they if they if they, they catch the eye basically. Yeah, yeah. Now I will say, and it's like a, a great selector told me once that uh, when I wasn't picked and it's a certain team that they voted for me, but the others didn't. <laughs> I vote. I vote. I had James. I had James Ryan down on the or James Lowe down on the, the, the my shortlist in 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 February. Right. Um, well, they didn't but I just it. think he's been exceptional. And it doesn't matter. Look, you could have, there's lots of other, the, the other judges had different players down that you don't agree. We're only a percentage of the vote. Um, then the public vote as well. So I think that's the good thing about this vote. It's it's a public vote. And then the judges, um, a certain percentage of our, 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 we make the final decision really um, at the end of it. But I think this public vote was, was very very heav- heavily weighed towards the public back in in February, and it was okay. it was it was difficult with the pool stage with COVID and everything like okay, that. Yeah. But we're down to the we're down to the final five: Josh van der Fleer, Gregory Aldrich, James Lowe, Caelan Doris, and Anton Dupont. People probably argued in in February that Dupont had only played one or two games because of COVID, but I just think he got in there because Toulouse were, got into the knockout stages and. And he's um, Antoine Dupont, you, World Player of the Year, would have been. Yeah, and you'd probably have you'd probably have egg in your face if Toulouse went on and won a round sixteen quarter exactly. final, semi final, final. Yeah, he's, and he's if they match. did that, he would have been there. So, um, I still think even in the games, you know that Munster game, Leinster game, he was he was brilliant. Um, Aldrich, I think, has been exceptional for La Rochelle. So we we'll see. And the other three yeah, are, are still all in it. Go on. You should, like I'm sure you still find a way of like giving the award to Peter O'Mahony. <laughs> <laughs> it's a public vote. I will, or, or, the, or the other judges. Everyone. Oh, I mean, it's the right call. What are you, right call what are you suggesting there? That you know your rugby. <laughs> right. Well, right. If Munster, Munster had won, he probably he could have got in there with oh, the performance totally, yeah. against Toulouse. But I think, look, um, the front runners here are. On, on, if, look, if 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 La Rochelle win the final against Leinster, which is a tall order. Gregory Aldrich is going to win. You it. would imagine. Yeah. Well, he might and he might not. If it's a very tight game, last score of the game where Lara Shell win it when some of the other players have okay. been exceptional. Well, look, we- um, but they're great players, and I think it's a great. I just wish he was there in 2008 when I had a probably a good season when Munster win it. I might have been in the running, but unfortunately, they only started in 2010. Right, always, always just a little bit ahead of your time, Quinny. Oh, That's oh, the problem. Oh, oh. Oh, and you'd have given it to me in 2008, wouldn't you? 100. percent Did you not get it that Thank year? You. Thank if you. If so, that's an absolute yeah. crime. Maybe off the ball can do up one uh, for 2008. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll retrospectively we'll grandfather one in. Quinny, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, lads. Thanks, guys. Alan Quillen's uh, combined 15. A uh, few talking points in it. 9:38 this morning. Uh, OTBM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. Burr Book says Jer has the guns out. It's officially summer. The guns are always there. They're just never visible. It's good to have him back. Yeah, they need to uh, slowly emerge from the calcification of two decades. Uh, OTBM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. I just did that, didn't I? We're back tomorrow from half seven. Adrian and Owen, La Rochelle head coach, Ronan O'Gara, basking in the glory of his side, reaching another Champions Cup final, will be live in the show tomorrow. We'll also have our GA Quick Picks, the crappy quiz is back, plus much more as well. Uh, Ronan O'Gara standing over a defeated Sexton after the final whistle will be a great sports picture, says Dave Cos. Munster fans should not want Leinster to win this. There should be none of this, oh, it's good for the game in Ireland. They shouldn't. But who's saying that? I'm sure Munster fans want to see Ronan O'Gara win this today. Yeah, but even uh, if he wasn't playing, it should be like... It would be quite funny if he got into another row with a coach, uh, Leo Cullen being <laughs> possibly the most polite head coach in the world. If he somehow managed to coax him into a sideline uh, scuffle... It'd be Felipe. Yeah. It'd be Felipe's last act. Well, yeah, that's true, actually. He that also would... seems like a pretty calm, collected coach, to be honest. Uh, they all do. That would be amazing. Right, Fiona Hayes and Keen Tracy on last night's Wednesday Night Rugby alongside Joe. Enjoy. Uh, Fiona, European Player of the Year five-man shortlist has been announced. Josh van der Fleer, James Lowe, Caelan Doris, Gregory Aldred, Anton Dupont. Obviously, the final will dictate things a touch, but... Of those five, who's your European Player of the Year and why? 
has to be Van der Fleer. I've um, every time the minute it was released, even the first list. I mean, he's just been outstanding. He's performed in every game. Um, his level of performance is even getting better with every game. He he's improved his carries. You know, people talked about his carries, and today we see a lot of stats around his tackle, his tackle count, and even his tackle tech. He's staying injury free. Um, so for me, he's been the absolute standout performer. I think the likes of Dupont, we know what he can bring. He probably in Europe he brought it in in different patches, but no one's been as consistent as Van der Fleer throughout the whole thing for me. Has anyone in the last decade improved as rapidly as Van der Fleer at his age? Yeah, it's 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 a good shout. I, I like I'm sure we'll get onto it, but I think there's so many Leinster players, not to that degree, but there's so many Leinster players who have seriously improved over the last few years, and I t- I just think that's down to the coaching. Um, the players are clearly unbelievably talented, unbelievably skilled, but the manner of the, the quality of the coaching that they're getting, I think, is taking a lot of players to, to new levels. You think of James Lowe, Jameson Gibson Park. Mm-hmm. I think Ross Maloney is a, a perfect example of another guy. I, I don't think there's many people who would have said that Ross Maloney would be starting in a Champions Cup final and will be like a pretty bunch of key player for, for Leinster at this stage a few years ago. And I think so much of that is down to the coaching. Um, I was talking about this to, in terms of Josh van der Fleer at the Aviva with John Duggan on Saturday. Like Leinster put such a huge emphasis on the breakdown. We can all see why because they, they play at such high speed and tempo but they have a designated coach who coaches the, the breakdown. That's Dennis Leamy and that's why Munster are trying to poach him now to take over their defence but before Dennis Leamy Hugh Hogan was doing it and the Scarlets came in and took him. So there aren't the, the breakdown is so important for every team for every country in the world but Leinster actually have a designated guy who's working on it day, week in, week out. And I think Josh van der Fleer has, reap, has reaped the rewards of that. I think, you know, the, the Rugby Players Ireland Awards are going to be on tonight. And I think, you know, he'd probably be the hot favourite to win that as well. I think James Lowe has had a great season as well. Um, he scored 13 tries this season and they've all come in his last eight games. Mm. I mean, just a ridiculous record. And to be fair everyone on that list I don't think there's too many who have the skill set that, that James Lowe has and we saw that again last weekend I think Aldridge is an outstanding player as well if it, like if Larachelle are to beat Leinster in the final I think you know and Aldridge has a good game I think he'll be nailed on uh, I don't know what Dupont is doing on that list I know that might be sacrilege to say but he hasn't had a great season by his very very high standards at all uh, I don't know is it a bit of keeping up appearances there or what but I don't think he was that great in the Champions Cup this season Well Alan Quillen is one of those on the panel so we'll take it up with him do just don't tell him I said it though. Just for the beauty of his <laughs> penalties at the Aviva alone, Dupont gets in that list. Oh, like don't don't get me wrong. I'm mean, I'm a huge fan, no, but I, I just don't think he's been at his best in the Champions Cup. Definitely feeling the effects. I think of a lot of rugby, mm. isn't he? Fiona, last Irish player to win men's European Player of the Year was Johnny. No, Johnny's yes. never won it. Oh, men's European. Oh, who was that? Would you know? Um, me? Brian Odri- no, it was Brian, after Brian, Brian Driscoll Brian has never Driscoll won it. Never has won never it. won it. Never won it. See, there was, there was Jamie Heaslip. Jamie Heaslip. Now there was this this issue. You remember Raj got like best player of the last fifteen years. Mm-hmm. So that was in twenty ten. Yeah. So I, I can't find a record if he won it before that. Maybe they only started it mm. in twenty ten. The last winner. Give this man some goddamn respect. Rob Carney, 2012. Carney. Yeah, Come on. We're never making another crappy quiz here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm bad One memory. shot and you're out. <laughs> yeah. Rob Carney, 12. Sean O'Brien, 11. And, yes, uh, that's right. Sean Raj O'Brien. in 10. But no Irishman since then. So um, you suspect that's odds on to change. So, Leinster Munster at the weekend. If we look forward for a moment, I'm sure we'll look back. Leinster have used 59 players thus far this season. You would presume it will be very much a second string affair from their point of view at the weekend. Fiona Munster, a win for them guarantees them a home quarter final. That said, yeah. by kickoff, if results go their way, i.e. if the Bulls and the Stormers Bulls. were to lose in Wales, then Munster would have a home quarter final, uh, regardless of the result at the Aviva Stadium. They're without Zebo and the Alande. We're mm. hearing Omani and Mike Haley in trouble as well. Gavin Coombs is back this week, but unlikely to uh, play. It's hard to be frothing at the mouth for this one, even though it is Leinster-Munster. What are you expecting from this game? 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good shot for us to get to watch a good game because um you know you've guys especially with Leinster second string you've guys trying to make um a European final a panel you know so there's lads going to be trying to push there that's not really set in stone obviously starting positions are there thereabouts are set in stone probably in Leo's mind with a lot of positions but you've guys that are trying to get onto that panel and and this game could be something if they made an impact in that so they're they're going to be chomping at the bit to come out and, and play a, a or a month their team up in the Aviva obviously Munster a lot has been talked about their form and how and how they've gotten better and better and I think it would be absolutely terrible to to come out after that two lose game and ha- haven't put everything on the line and lose up in the Aviva to what people are calling a second string Leinster team we know Leinster obviously have the players and the backup can you even call it second string but but obviously it, it wouldn't be their starter for a European Cup final um, so it's very very important for this Munster team to, to keep on kicking and they're probably going to be looking at if if at all possible trying to get that bonus point as well which will give them advantage then going into the, the semi-final if they can if they can kick on from the quarter final because they would like obviously to be using Tom Park for that as well. I was a touch surprised, Keane, when I saw Leinster have used 59 players this season. I just assumed, given the fewer number of matches in the URC, uh, not least when players are in, away on in international duty, that that number would be rapidly coming down and we might see even players' contracts not renewed over the coming years, that there were n- new demands on squad depth. But 59 is a hefty number. I mean, I remember Joe Schmidt being lauded when he hit 50 for the first time. Yeah, they've been consistently hitting these high numbers for the last few seasons and there is talk now that the the squad might not be as big um, next season but you look at how well they manage it you know, there was so much made of bringing the like, let's call a spade a spade it was a second string young team to South Africa but it's how well Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster managed that period like I remember I was in with you you know, talking to you about it just around the time and that Lancaster stayed at home yeah. and, you know, Leinster are, are far, far better for that on both fronts because they got their numbers up in terms of the 59 there was a couple of caps handed out um, like in South Africa in the Lions Den as well absolutely and th- those type of games are seriously going to stand to, like I guarantee at the start of next season you'll see like Lee Barron I remember was a guy a young hooker who got capped in South Africa like, you know he could potentially start the next the first game of next season people are going oh who is this guy but you forget that he was actually away in South Africa for two weeks you know going to an extremely tough place against like particularly that Sharks team who were loaded with Springboks so um, unbelievably impressive um, numbers but it's the quality of players that they're bringing in um, we, 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 I was chatting to, to Hugo Keenan today and he was sort of saying during that during that period when the most of the the first team were in Dublin they had to get sub academy lads so they were digging even deeper down into the, the talent pool and he said you know the first day you'd know that they hadn't quite trained in a Stuart Lancaster infamous like training session but he said by the end of the week he said it was ridiculous like that the players just get it instantly so that they're the calibre of young players like they very rarely bring duds even into the sub academy I mean you only get in there if you're of a certain quality and it was interesting to kind of hear Keenan talk about the level like these guys are only fresh out of school but at the one week with Stuart Lancaster's training and they were already up with the calls and things like that so 59 is an incredible number really but um wow. It's yeah, it's so impressive. Just what Munster yeah. want to hear, Fiona. <laughs> yeah, and with just on that point as well, Joe. Um, with that, I think it's like it's so good, and that's why we're seeing the likes of Johnny come into really good form. Johnny Sexton, you, you know, Doris, because they're able to be rotated enough. If you compare them to the French guys that that, that they're playing against, who've probably played 29, 26, 27 games, some of these players have probably played maybe 18, 12 to 18 games, and that shows when it comes to the end of the season. And Lens are have the luxury to do that because they have the talent pool coming in and I think that's that's what's making these guys so effective in this Leinster squad coming into these last few games Yeah wasn't it interesting Hugo Mala making that point of uh, <laughs> Sexton and Intermac 12 matches versus 27 and to be fair Fiona I mean if we segue into just how good Leinster were on Saturday mm. one of the most striking aspects from minute one was one team here is uber fresh sharp fit the other team were uh, running on fumes a touch, really. Yeah, you could see it from from the off. Obviously, Leinster were exceptionally hungry. They're really hungry for that fifth star. You could see it in how they played. Um, 
that nothing to take away from Leinster, but that wasn't the Toulouse squad that we've seen in, in Europe in previous occasions. Probably saw a touch of it up in Ulster at times, but it wasn't the type of game I thought they'd bring. Um, obviously, they were really tired. I think we especially saw that in, in, in the front row. I, I thought they weren't as effective around the pitch. Maybe at scrum time they were uh, at times, um, but I just thought it was just even DuPont, we, you talked about him there, Key, and we didn't see his best form really in that game into Mac. The playmakers, I mean, Thomas Ramos was very, was very, very good and they had certain players, but just as a squad, Leinster looked so much fresher. They played the best rugby. They never, ever looked like they were going to lose that game from minute one. And their key players were, were pl- probably playing some of the best games they've played in a long time. Is there a your player out of form right now? No. You, could, you could almost say, I could almost say, who's the uh, under uh, appreciated cog in that wheel? And you could pick anyone there, 1 to 15, and, and, and speak glowingly for a paragraph about them. If you look back at their last three games at this particular, the first choice team have played, we'll, so we'll say Connacht, um, Matthew Viva, Leicester away and Toulouse last weekend they've all been 8 and 9s yeah. out of 10 absolutely exceptional mm-hmm. funny funny thing apparently the, in the review on Monday with Stuart Lancaster Stuart Lancaster runs the reviews um, you know there was an acknowledgement of how well they played but the big focus was why were we 7-3 down early on and that to me sums up the, the mindset of this Leinster team like I wonder at times do we actually appreciate how like what we're actually watching at the moment in terms of the style of rugby that they're playing because like we're so used to like a Toulouse team or whatever playing this unbelievable type of rugby and going oh it'd be great if like an Irish team could adopt that so at times I wonder if we appreciate like there's going to be a bit of coaching you know there could be coaching upheaval in Leinster over the next couple of years so we might not always be like this now obviously they still have to go on and deliver against La Rochelle but like, I mean I would certainly expect that they will but mm. the fact that you know the, the big focus was on okay like why were we down to these guys we ended up winning really well but like we shouldn't be behind in, in this game so um, it just goes back to my earlier point I just think the coaching is just unbelievably good at yeah. the moment in Leinster um, and you know what like we said we're, we're seeing players improve but like it's young guys as well and Fiona kind of made the point there but you know guys are playing to try and get into the Champions Cup squad um, the, the match day squad next week but the reality is, like, is anyone really is is the twenty three going to be any different than what it was last week? It, like yeah. injuries permitting, because you like you, someone's going to have a hell of a game against Munster. Abs- <laughs> like absolutely, like like Jordan Larmer is going to need to score a hat trick or four tries to get on it as twenty yeah. third man. Like that's the that's the reality of how well Leinster are playing at the moment. Now, obviously, they do have a couple of injuries and there are a couple of key injuries as well. So um, if they're not fit, that could upset the apple apple cart a bit. But um, they're just humming at the moment. Yeah. Absolutely humming. I think you're right on the do we appreciate. A point. Mm. It was only funny just being in Virgin on uh, the Sunday for the La Rochelle Racing game, Matt Williams, and we were just you know chatting during the game as we do, and, and Leinster were st- we were still you know talking about how good Leinster had been the previous day, and and he was just saying it's unique. This is unique in world rugby what you guys have here, and it's almost when an outside voice says it. And Matt really has a great feel for the global game and has been all over the game for decades around the world. And he was saying you know to have to play that brand of rugby, to have coaches. Stuart Lancaster aside there are exceptions to all of these points I'm making but to have coaches who've come through at Leinster as players to have the vast majority of the players from the immediate hinterland and mm. you know there's the James Lowe and Gibson Park and there's a Caelan Doris sprinkled in but the in effect all the players from the immediate hinterland it's just like it's it's the Barcelona of European rugby it's absolutely staggering perhaps one of the reasons we don't appreciate it is and I was just thinking about it Fiona watching the Toulouse game mm-hmm. unlike say in football where you see Man City's best 9, 10, 11 most weeks playing their best stuff most weeks rugby doesn't allow that we're talking about the freshness of a Johnny Sexton I was just talking to a friend who said I, I, I feel like I haven't really seen Leinster play much this season until the Toulouse game I was kind of saying well in a way you haven't because they don't really have to play until about April you know they've only they've only really kind of had a bit of a flex for the Leicester game and the Toulouse game and so it's only it might be in this part of the season that they show everyone just how good they can be yeah, you, you definitely see glimpses of it in games, but they haven't been as clinical as they have been in those few games. And it's it's super to watch. You know, I was watching um, the Blues at the weekend. I was watching the Super 15 rugby and some of their scores were absolutely outrageously good. And I, and I was getting excited. 
But the, but the, but watching that, they just don't offer the same thing in defence. You just don't see that. They're massively high-scoring games. But what we saw with the likes of Leinster and what we're seeing is is their defensive system is so good. Their breakdown work, everything is is on the money. The way they, they work with the referee is so good. And obviously, they, are, they play that attacking style of rugby as well. That offloading game has come on in the last couple of years. So they're playing the same style of rugby, but it's they're looking at all areas of the game. And I mean, their set piece at the weekend, I think they had 100% Scrums. I know there was penalty advantage and they're not counted in the stats sometimes, but there was 100% on their own scrum and the 91% accuracy in the line out. So they seem to have nailed all the areas and look like they're definitely enjoying the rugby. And it's, 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 it's when you say it like that, you know, that we don't appreciate it. I think, I think it's, it's clear that we don't because what we're seeing is, is, and if they go on to win it, we'll say that this is probably one of the best performances in Europe, what they're, they're especially the Toulouse game. And hopefully we'll get the same in the final because because the French power didn't look anywhere like they could do anything in that to lose pack. And I'll be I'll be looking on to see what La Rochelle w- and what area they will try and target. There isn't really a weakness they can target in this Leinster team. Interesting, because I was listening to you chatting on the left wing with Will and Luke Fitzgerald, Keane, and you were saying <coughs> if there is... And like, cause we, you got a nitpick here. I mean, if that if that's a glimpse into Lancaster's team meetings, yeah, I think we're entitled to. Exactly. Uh, you think there is a question mark over Leinster scrum? I do, yeah. Now I bow to Fiona's superior knowledge of, of yeah. the scrum now. I'll set you up to fail here against yeah, yeah. Uh, Grand Slam winning prop, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. go on. Um, well, like they've conceded nine scrum penalties in the last two games. I mean, that is not good. Um, they've conceded five in Welford Road against Leinster and four last week. Now I know Tyg Furlong went off, but there's been issues when Tyg Furlong was on the pitch as well. Um, I think it's an area of, of weakness, I do, and I think it's an area of weakness for Ireland at the moment as well. Um, you know, so much depends on Tyg Furlong's fitness, but... Leinster really struggled against this La Rochelle scrum last season and you saw the way they played against Racing. Like that's how they're gonna to look to play against Leinster as well. They're just gonna to look to take the game to them up front and you know if they do if if Rog does pull a large rabbit out of the hat by having Will Skelton back then that adds another like layer of serious beef as well to it so I do think it's an area of concern I know we've chatted about it before Joe about the depth chart and I won't go into that again in terms of Irish rugby but it's not even a depth chart issue really at the moment it's just whatever is going on the teams are are targeting the Leinster scrum and the point I was trying to make because I was actually writing about this on Monday and you're kind of like do I really want to go down this road of like trying to nitpick what was one of the great European performances but you hear stuff like how Lou, Lou, or if Short Lancaster carries on in reviews and they are looking to be the, the pursuit of perfection is essentially what it is so um, yeah I think they are going to have to really tighten up on, on that area because like I said La Rochelle will certainly go after them and just on the point of you know, appreciating what this Leinster team are about and what they do. I think they're a quite likable team as well. I just don't think there's any, like, major huge egos. I think they're all pretty, like, grounded fellas. I don't get the sense that anyone is, is ru- getting losing the run of themselves. And I would have been talking to a couple of Irish coaches who were coaching abroad, like, o- over the last couple of months or whatever. And you can apply whatever we're saying about Leinster to Ireland as well because it's essentially the same thing. But... I was amazed by how many of them told me that they're now they use clips of Ireland in their team meetings and before that would have been unheard of but it's the respect that other players have now so Hugo Keenan is a good example I know I know one particular Irish coach was using a lot of Hugo Keenan in, how, in, in terms of how he marshals the backfield and this is a guy who's only just after pretty much breaking onto breaking onto the scene I mean he's never even been to a Champions Cup final as a fan let alone played in one you know so the respect, I think, of Irish rugby and Leinster rugby in particular. We heard during lockdown how themselves and the Crusaders were sharing ideas and stuff. So that's the level of esteem that they're being held in at the moment. So I just think like people within Ireland, I know it's obviously difficult for non-Leinster supporters, but just to appreciate the, the, the kind of rugby that they're playing. And hopefully, like we've already seen that it's having a knock-on effect with Ireland, but you know, going down the summers into New Zealand is going to be the ultimate test of that. Yeah, and Fiona, just on the scrum point, I'll give you a chance yeah. to come back because, again, to my, and I emphasise, very untrained eye, I did see the Toulouse scrum go through Leinster a couple of times on Saturday. So why did that not give you cause for concern as such? Yeah, you see, it's with, like, it's obviously all got to do with the, the referee. And I think especially with Furlong, I think a lot of guys angling him. When Alain Latour came on, I thought he was in trouble. Um 
I actually thought that it was so early in the game. I thought they might have. Now, Leinster, obviously, it's not even on their books, but I thought there might have been a chance of maybe Healy coming on and moving Porter back across, but it doesn't look like they're going to do that. Maybe come, it depends on Furlong's availability, but definitely Ala Latoa, scrum-wise, he's going to be targeted. We saw Cyril Boyle absolutely busted through him and stuff like that, and, and they were taken there. I suppose on the whole outcome of the game, it wasn't very, very important because it just, the, the scrum dominance wasn't shown for to lose but if you're going to European final it's definitely somewhere they will they will have to 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 target. I think personally and I and I've said this a lot of the times, I think the front row of Porter, uh Furlong and either two hookers, um I think the scrummage in wise Leinster, you know, when I've watched it, when they have given away penalties, I've thinking I've thought the referee has been there's been angles in in them and they'll have to deal with that. And Wayne Barnes is definitely going to be watching that area. So it is obviously a focus that they'll have, but I, I wouldn't be an area of concern to me, even though the two lose and we know what Lurish Shell done and they they got a good few penalties out of Rassing as well. I mean you've got and Antonio and Priso in the front row and and they're just immense but I really feel like Leinster can if they can get their their main front line guys out there and hopefully Furlong will be fit I think they'll be looking to hold and secure their own ball which is what they done they had a 100% success rate on their own ball whereas when when um when Toulouse were attacking that's when they got damaged so they probably will work around that area of of setting a bit lower when it's a, on a Toulouse ball or just, sorry a, a Rochelle ball J- Joseph a big fan for you. OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with a 